Welcome to the Australasian and ASEAN segment of Emergence 2021. I'm very happy that you could join us for this grand occasion where we empower innovation, capital and ambition. I would like to introduce to you a an amazing lineup of guests, keynote speakers and panelists for this session. Firstly, James Calignotis, who's the Managing Director of DeepBridge Australia. John Sharp from Hatcher Plus, who's got an incredibly unique way of approaching venture investment. Joseph Mokanu, who's the Managing Partner at Verge Health Tech. Kui J Lim, who's the Founder and Executive Director at Vision Group and will also be the moderator for this panel session. You'll also get to watch panel sessions and discussions around Asian investment trends as well as cryptocurrency and blockchain trends. This segment will feature companies in the sectors of clean tech, AI, biotech, edutech, fintech, blockchain, life science, consumer products, healthcare, SaaS, media tech, prop tech, and also ride sharing. Now, last but not least, jump onto the Brella app. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of conversations taking place inside Brella right now. More than that, set up on one screen Brella so you can have your discussions with people. Set up your other screen, the live stream. So the best of all, you can have the live stream and also be having discussions all at the one time. Perfect for the mind that loves to do two things at one time. Enjoy this next session. Presenting now is Opaso, an Australian IT services and solutions company that provides software development services to businesses and has built an e-learning platform, Vermaza, for Indian cultural content. Here to talk about this further is CEO Srinivas Kalva. Oh, hi. My name is uh, Srinivas Kalva. I'm the managing partner of Opasa. Today, I'm here to present Bimarza and the platform and its features. Before we get started, I want to play a quick video on the Bimarza platform. Are you an Indian artist, skillsman, craftsman, or someone similar? Do you have expertise in an art form, a skill, a craft which you want to show to the world? Vimarza makes it possible for you. From non-resident Indians who miss home to enthusiastic Indophiles who love India, everyone wants to learn more about Indian traditions and culture. At Vimarza, we help you create and curate courses to spread knowledge across the globe. All you need to do is register on vimarza.com. Choose from hundreds of categories of art forms and skills. Start creating content to reach out to more audience. Build a strong network of learners, help them master in various art forms, and create an engaging community. What's more, you get to earn royalty commissions from the courses and other contents that you make available on Vimarza. Help India's rich cultural heritage reach the world. Join Vimarza today. Opasa is the Australia-based company. We are based in Melbourne with the teams in Sydney and uh, India. We are delivering Vimarza, a cloud-based online marketplace that's primarily focused on promoting the Indian cultural content and serving the na needs of native Indians that are living globally. What problem are we solving? Today, we have about 32 million people from India that live outside of India. They, in, the people that are living outside of India, they want to continue pursuing their Indian, uh, their passion of Indian, uh, learning the Indian classical music, the dance, learning the languages, and staying connected with the global cultural concerts. There is a significant demand for this type of content, and there is a shortage of instructors and content in the market, especially for the people that are living outside of India. So we built Vimarza. It's an online platform that's focused on connecting people with Indian cultural and heritage content. With the help of authentic Indian creators that are currently living in India, we bring them onto our platform and connect them with the interested students to, so that they can learn the languages, the culture, the art, and the music from the experts. Why Vimarza? It connects, it provides an opportunity for the students to learn the Indian uh, languages. It provides an opportunity for them to learn the Indian classical music. 
it provides them an opportunity for them to take the classes right from their room and also network with people across the world. And it could be the peer students from Canada, US, UK, or Singapore. It's these people that are living outside of India, they can together learn the Indian cultural content and the courses. So what exactly is the problem? If I take my own personal example, my son wants to pursue his Indian cultural music. Sometimes it takes two years to pursue a, a teacher that can teach him. Either the schools are full and there's a two, two, uh, waiting period of two or three years or there is not enough teachers that can teach that particular art form. So we are trying to change that. We bring the content creators wherever they are. They could be in India, they could be in US, they could be in UK. So we sign them up onto our platform and we connect them with the students that are interested in pursuing the content. We are the only platform that's available in the marketplace. There are other e-learning platforms that are available in the market, such as Udemy, Coursera, Tutor.com, Baiju's, but they are focused on a different kind of content. Vimarza is the only platform that's focused on promoting the Indian cultural content. And as such, we have the first mover advantage. There are benefits to the participants, and there are also benefits to the content creators. For the participants, it provides them with an opportunity to pursue content that's not readily available. They can pursue this content with their, from the instructors of their choice. They can, they can learn this at their own free time based upon their school schedules or sports schedules. They have an opportunity to interact with, with their peers from other countries. And they can learn at their own pace. The benefits to the chairperson, the content creators, and they could be anywhere. It provides them an opportunity to reach the audience globally. They can work at their own schedule as well. They can set their own price for their content. Unlike YouTube where it is free, you know, they can name the price and then they can pursue the, the they can offer their talent and courses build a global brand, and most importantly, share their knowledge and experience with the next generation. On the platform, the content creators can create their contents either through live conferencing, it could be a one-to-one -one session, live sessions, it could be uh, multi-user sessions, or it could be one-way broadcast, or it could be a pre-recorded video. We promote the content, the content creator and the content globally and attract the students onto the platform. So Vimarza is built on cloud. It is available for all the users any, wherever they are um, globally. We have high quality video content. We have integrated the platform with secured payment gateways. We, we have capability to send notifications, emails, SMS before the class starts. We have a configurable revenue sharing algorithm to share the revenue with the content creators. Coming to the market size, as I said, this is the only platform that currently exists today that can offer the Indian cultural content. It brings the content creators and the consumers onto a single platform. And we have 36 million people that are living outside of India. And we project that we will be profitable in year one and generating a revenue of $7.5 million within the first two and a half years. So where are we uh, with the uh, commercializing of the platform? The platform is fully built and it's currently in production. We have gone live and signing up with the content creators. 
we have received interest from 500 content creators and we're currently onboarding them and training the content creators on the platform. From in the quarter two of this year, we, are, we will be signing up the content consumers, the students, and uh, you know, fully commercialize the platform. We are asking for an investment of a million dollars, primarily to help out with the operations, marketing the product and building the brand globally, and also maturing the scaling the platform. We have a strong team of 10 engineers and three member management team that's working full time in building this platform and commercializing this. Thank you for joining the speech. If you are, if there is, if you have any questions, please connect me on Braille or send me an email. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Presenting now is Jenny Yusto, a fintech enabler, a solutions and services provider who deliver end-to-end next-gen digital banking technologies to banking, securities, finance, insurance, and other sectors globally. Here to talk about this further is CEO and co-founder Shane Hermans. Hello, my name's Shane Hermans. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Geniesto, and the time has never been more right for investing in the digital future than right now. Our platform-based business model gives our clients, partners, and investors potential for exponential growth. We accelerate financial institutions beyond their limits through digital transformation. So we provide next-generation financial platforms that essentially supercharge banks, financial service providers, and insurance companies for financial inclusion, financial education, and economic growth in the ASEAN region. The biggest problem in this uh, region is essentially the cost of not digitalizing. As we've seen uh, COVID as a catalyst to digitalize has really brought uh, about a massive transformation or call or need for transformation. But what happens if they don't start that process now? How will they survive? How will communities essentially reestablish themselves and get back into economic growth? How will small businesses start to grow? This could be a life or death situation for many communities in the rural uh, areas of these emerging markets. So we work together with financial institutions and change how work gets done. By supercharging uh, these financial institutions with our lead, leading edge technology, we can essentially create greater efficiencies, efficiencies that reduce operational costs, improve risk management, and onboard more customers so that they can serve more. Our core platforms include omni-channel banking, which is mobile and internet banking for retail and business, loans management and loans origination software, core banking for digital banks, and our social banking platform. So what sets us apart from our, our competitors? Essentially, we are digital bank builders. We can roll out a bank from zero to 360 degrees, a bank in a box. Our technology is modular, so it can be quickly scaled by banks into new markets uh, with partners for integration and obviously it braces legacy systems. The team itself is highly experienced globally and locally with our core management team based here on the ground in the field serving our customers and clients. We did a little bit of a competitor analysis just to give you an idea where we are positioned in the market. Now you can see their genius though, Mark Green, so that you can understand that we have a very mature uh, technology capability that we're offering to the market. And it's through co-opetition where we collaborate and integrate with our competition. So you can see that we've recently formed a very solid partnership with Iradian to roll out our omni-channel banking over the top of their core banking system. Uh, this is a powerful business model. In fact, we're opening up partnerships uh, in new markets uh, across the Eastern European bloc, Africa, and even North America. Our traction is ever growing. And you can see by uh, some of these um, uh, logos here that we've established a really good presence in a short period of time. In fact, we've rolled out more than 40 projects in over 25 countries since 2015. We have around 30 projects in the pipeline now, and we'd see at least half a dozen of those mature over 2021. 
with more than 5 million mobile and internet banking users today, we expect to double that in the next 12 months. Four contracts were signed in November 2019, and we signed a further five contracts during the COVID epidemic, um, which is a true indicator that financial institutions are ready to start their transformation process. From 2018 to 2019, we experienced a 40% growth in gross revenue. So what's behind the technology or the business itself? It's the management team with key experts uh, in their own right uh, as product specialists from lending, senior architects and engineers to accountants and lawyers, we're able to collectively combine our skilled resources to deliver and roll out projects on a global scale. Our current Series A Plus is an ask of $7.5 million. Uh, we're looking to raise this to scale up our business model so that we can further enable our clients in the ASEAN region in exchange for 20% of the company of or equity of ordinary shares with a pre-money valuation of USD $30 million. So what are we going to do with this funds? Essentially, we're going to invest this money into further development, uh, some IP enhancements, human resources and equipment so that we can take on more projects and reach more customers and partners throughout ASEAN region, and importantly, create a very strong uh, brand presence through marketing and expansion, uh, utilizing some of this capital for scaling. So some key milestones uh, that we've achieved uh, over the last 12 months, uh, and there's some exciting uh, events that have really occurred for us that's really sort of starting to shape the company on the right curve upward. Uh, we did sign a neo-banking project uh, in November in the UK, this is a really powerful business case for us. Um, we expect that to go live somewhere in Q2. Uh, we did sign a contract, uh, actually an extremely large contract in Singapore with a payment services company for internet banking and payments. Uh, we're expected to go live for this uh, somewhere in Q3. Um, in fact, that project itself uh, went through the requirements gathering process. We identified that um, the initial requirements in our uh, essentially four times that, that we originally estimated. So this is an exciting project for us to be uh, working on and our first project in Singapore. Um, we expect to monetize uh, transactions uh, with income coming off transaction fees with two banks in the Philippines this quarter and uh, furthermore uh, monetizing transactions uh, with our Singapore partner uh, at the end of Q1. Uh, recently, we've uh, taken on a new investor into the fold, which uh, is part of our strategy to expand into the uh, Malaysian market. So this is a really exciting um, investor that's come in uh, who's bringing more than just money. They're bringing capability and they have a strong vision to help us grow into the ASEAN region uh, in Malaysia. Uh, we do have a business banking rollout in the Philippines uh, set Q3 this year, which is a very exciting project. It'll be the, our first business banking platform uh, here in the Philippines. And uh, toward Q4, we intend to take advantage of the opportunities and business offers that we have on the table to expand into Indonesia. Some investment highlights for you is that Geniesto is really unlike um, your typical fintech startup. We have a fully developed next-gen platform uh, based business model with a very strong proven track record uh, in more than 25 countries with more than 5 million users. Our world-class team uh, is of a high caliber. These guys are experts uh, in uh, all fields of financial services and, and fintech implementations worldwide uh, and collectively uh, could give us a, a very strong advantage in the market. We are also strategically positioned for digital transformation or DX in the right place at the right time. There's never been a better opportunity for digital transformation in the ASEAN region than right now. I'd like to thank you very much for your time and hope to hear from you very soon and welcome your investment to Geniesto. Thank you. Presenting now is Paygrip, a leading provider of software as a service and software with the service, payroll and human capital management solutions to multinational companies and workforce management companies operating across 33 countries. Here to talk about this further is Managing Director Mark Samlal and Chief Commercial Officer Sachin Goklani. 
It's a delight to be presenting at Emergence 2021. I'm Mark Samlal. I'm the Managing Director and Founder of Pay Group, listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Today, also presenting with me is Sachin Goklani, our Chief Commercial Officer. Pay Group. We are a leading provider of human capital management, payroll, software and services that are included in the Gardner Guide for three years running, tremendous industry accolade. What we provide to our clients is a scalable SaaS platform offering full service, hire to retire suite of modules, 27, payroll, payroll services and payments associated with that. Our full payroll outsourcing, as well as our SaaS platforms, processes over 5.4 million pay slips around treasury payments per year. We're cash generative, we're profitable for the last four quarters, and we're supported by an excellent client base with strong repetitive revenues, three years contract, and 95% client, percent client retention. We have a geographical reach of over 41 countries and growing, and it's serviced by 11 different locations of our offices that are strategic in nature. Of course, our board is highly experienced in our domain, and we have an excellent world-class management team. The investable thematics of Pay Group are very clear. We've had a growth in our transactions from IPO just over two years ago, from 430,000 to now 5.4 million annualised. As we've reported on the ASX, in our FY21, which ends March 31, we've recorded sales of record levels of numbers. We have a minimum of a three-year client contract. They automatically extend, and over 95% of our revenues are recurring in nature that augments to our 95% client retention rate. So we are fast growing and it is a repetitive revenue business. I'll pass over to Sachin to take you through our half year performance snapshot. Thank you very much, Mark. And it's a delight to present at Emergence 2021. So as Mark mentioned, um, we released our half year uh, snapshot uh, to the ASX uh, for our September end period because we're a March year end. And through our growth, it shows strong performance in revenues. We've got a positive EBITDA position. We've got our first ASX announcement of a positive NPAT position. And all that has led to us having a fourth quarter positive, adding to our operating cash flow um, and bank balance. All the revenues, EBITDA and NPAT is underpinned by a growth in sales, which leads to more number of payslips and more number of treasury transactions, which then lead to uh, the business performing better. So we were at the half year at the end of September at 5.2 million payslips annualized. And I'll take you later through it, which is now up to 5.4 million as at the end of December, demonstrating continued growth. And all that's underpinned by record new sales, which were 5.4 million as at September. And we've had a further quarter up to December, which has made it even better. And I'll come to that shortly. We um, have a great diversified client base in both the corporate and the workforce management companies. And we provide all our payroll services, our human capital management modules, as well as our payments and treasury transactions to all our customers across 41 countries. And as you can see here, our customers are global MNCs who have a widespread of um, entities, subsidiaries across the 41 geographies that we present um, and, and are present in. One of the things that underpins our great growth and our great organic growth is our global partnership program. And what this program is, is we partner with multinational payroll partners around the world for example, CloudPay in the UK, Ultimate Software in the US, Payroll Inc. in Japan, Flair in Australia, Emetis in Ireland, TransKills in the Middle East. What this partnership program delivers to Pay Group is accelerating our growth with a low customer acquisition cost because it's our partners who are the ones signing with the customer. 
and we work for our partners to deliver in the great 41 countries that we offer deep domain expertise. We are very tightly integrated with our partners, so it's a sticky solution for us with our partners as well as with our partners and their clients. We're up to eight partners now, up from four at the end of um, uh, half one in FY20, so we'll continue to expand that partnership, and that not only expands our geography but also um, the type of customers um, that we get. And our global partner program is now contributing a significant number of um, revenue stream for our business. All that's led to an update at the end of December, which is a um, snapshot of our scorecard. So new sales have grown um, to 8.2 million in the nine months for this financial year, and that compares to 5.5 million last year. So it's really strong growth. And as Mark mentioned, through the tailwinds of COVID, very, very pleasing. That sales has led to more um, annualized payslips and transactions, which leads to greater revenue. We've had both organic growth and acquired growth as listed there, and Mark will touch on that shortly. And through the organic and acquired growth, we've really increased our client base. And by increasing our client base, we create more upsell and cross-sell opportunities, getting more revenue from our clients. Our internal employee growth has been organic and we found some efficiencies within our processes, so we haven't really had to add too many more employees as revenue grows. And as I mentioned earlier, our operating cash position is very strong um, and we are in the fourth quarter already of our operating cash flow positive position. Thanks, Sachin. Um, it's been a tremendous year in FY21 and we're very excited about what FY22 brings pay group. We continue to deliver on our key performance metrics from IPO to today, exceed them, and our growth strategy is underpinned by our four key pillars. One, growth in ARR and pay slips. We're on track for our significant growth in ARR. We're on track on our growth in pay slips, and we're excited about what FY22 brings us um, as we have onboarded great new businesses that bring great client bases to pay group. A geographic expansion is important. As we onboarded Payroll HQ, Australia's fastest growing corporate payroll outsourcing company last year, the clients are predominantly Australia. So the opportunity for their clients to work within the pay group's 41 country as an upsell is a clear advantage to us. And that's moved from 18 countries at IPO to now 41, and we will grow further. We'll focus with one of our board members, Frank Niron Bansell, to increase our global partnerships so that low client acquisition is a key part of pay group strategy. And we'll continue to enhance and grow our material ARR as we've experienced 9% to date from our global partnerships. They are deeply integrated and take time and investment but ultimately extremely profitable for us. Pay, pay Group's very clear. Um, with our ASX listing and our garden recognition, the marketplace of our industry has shown that we are an ideal place to acquire new client bases to tuck into our existing framework. A global HCM talent tool our payroll technology, our pay bill technology and our payments framework are very well established to leverage on more new business through organic sales and through acquisitions. So we have considerable um, development and research. We'll continue to do that. We'll continue to increase the features of our modules and certainly increase our client share of wallet. Closing out today's presentation is just a recap of who our board members are. Ian Basser, Workforce Management Expert, ran Chandler McLeod, Frank Niran Bansell, ex-ADP, ran $1.5 billion of ADP's revenue. David Fagan, assisting greatly with us on our banking and finance for our payments area. And Shane Gills, our most recent joining to our board, who's known our business for over two years. It's been a delight to present to you today at Emergence 2021, and we look forward to having you as new shareholders to pay group. Thank you.
Presenting now is Learning Pod Group, who deliver customised education for all children to meet their needs by empowering students with knowledge and supporting our communities with skills for the future. Here to talk further about this opportunity is co-founders and co-directors, Tisha Hoyer and Dan Hoyer. Hi, I'm Dan. And I'm Tisha. And welcome to Learning Pod's investment opportunity. Both founders and directors will be walking you through this presentation. We look forward to talking further in our deal room crisp, which is located on the bottom right of your screen. Learning Pod Group. Learning Pod sees itself as a leader in education that has acknowledged the problem and is here to provide a solution to all parties. We deliver customized education for all children to meet their needs by empowering students with knowledge and supporting our communities with skills for the future. Yeah, we're truly here to disrupt the current way education is being delivered. Problem. What we have seen firsthand is education is set by expected outcomes. Mm. It lacks communication, history and data as a child develops. We're being able to break this down into three core areas. One being tutoring. This is usually viewed in a negative way and is often taken up with resistance and hesitance from a child. And then the child is further bullied by their peers. And this is not okay and a huge problem. Issue two, tracking. There is no current process in place to track and measure these advancements from seed. Mm. And thirdly, teaching. A teacher isn't knowing a child's milestones or their history in development. The current education model is not suited for our individual children who are in an ever-changing facing world. As we dug through the problem, we've come up with the three T's, teaching, tracking and tutoring. Teachers face a classroom outdated with lack of formal data on a student's knowledge. Mm. And parents often don't have the correct data on a child until it's too late for required intervention. Tutoring is seen negative. We need to make it a unique learning style experience and bring back that passion for the children and the families. With a healthy mindset around education, this will also have the result in a reduction of mental health issues and disruptions in the classroom, which both have a ripple effect in the greater community. At LearningPod, we love solving problems. I think we love it just as much as this next motto. <laughs> Acknowledge the problem, provide a solution. We believe that empowering the student and engaging parents or caregivers plus supporting the school is vital for their development. Yeah, we've really nutted this down into four key areas that we need to tackle to provide this solution. One being early intervention, giving support to families and child right from birth. Second, Customise education to the child's abilities, not based on the child's age or their year. Third is trackable factual data on their education and their development right from birth. And fourth, a youthful inspired space, a space of inclusion that anyone can thrive in. Learning Pods Fertiliser Solution. It's no secret anymore. Our team is trained to identify a child's unique learning style and implement it for a higher standard of learning. Our team has the passion and drive for success. Yeah. Our secret has been not only focusing on the problem, we've been focusing on solving a solution, a sustainable profit gain for the future, providing a long-term commitment from our families and customer base. Our rivals in comparison. With our future focus foundations and accountability for direction, this puts Learning Pod in a unique position for the next stage of growth. This is something well worth chatting about in our deal room. Absolutely. Our rivals will be left behind. For sure. What we have here is Learning Pod's addressable market, the market our rivals have left behind. Yeah, we've really been able to perfect a unique structure and product offering with interconnecting income and the scalable model that works. We have below three core areas that is a huge market potential, one being the education and tutoring market. 
Not only is this available to us, it is also available to us from birth, not just from when the child attends school. This is a huge growing area. Second, the National Disability Scheme, known as NDIS. We've been successfully approved for three categories and we're on our way to be approved for two more. This is another huge growing area and is fully government funded. And thirdly, parties and educational supplies. This just keeps it fun all year round. And over 70% of families need or feel the need rather to provide their child with the party or the next bad item. Mm. So we've really been able to perfect these three core areas and keep our customers engaged all year round. This also gives us that financial security should any of these fluctuate over the years. Our company's penetration so far, it all started for us in 2017 with one location and 50 kids. Yeah, and as we were growing our students, we then started to introduce an additional income stream. From there, we introduced another, introduced, sorry, rather another a location with an agreement with a national franchise. And from there on, last year, really, we have five locations and over 800 families, additional licenses and partnerships and a real stronger IP and a team that was ready to thrive. We are really here and ready to disrupt the way education is getting delivered as it stands. A little bit about Dan and I. It may come to a shock to you, as it does for many, but we have four homegrown children of our own, our oldest being 16 years of age, driving on his else and had his year 12 ball last week. Outside of our four homegrown children, we've been fostering for over 12 years. We've had over 100 children come into our home, right from newborns that were addicted to meth, broken bones, 26 broken bones in a newborn baby, right down to older children that just know that where they've currently come from, it's not okay and they want to change. We deserve a right to be able to be happy in our life. That doesn't matter how old you are or where you come from. And Dan and I really have seen the importance on how important it is to give this empowerment to a child, give them that passion to succeed because no one can take that away from them, no matter if they come from a stable home or a disadvantaged home or have just had something tragic happen to them. So by investing in us, you will be knowing that we have a true understanding that life isn't easy out there and we need to be making a difference. Throughout this time of fostering, we also started a company. We introduced online meal ordering to the education sector back in 2010, even before Apple introduced the iPad. This was a huge growing company and we ended up receiving multiple interested parties as we started to approach their comp our competitors at the time. We then later sold this off as a share sale and is now owned by Global Payments. When we started this company, we ensured that it had its own sustainable growth. It was a product that was easy to use, had multiple interconnecting income, and that would withstand the future. This product now is and still is currently used by hundreds of thousands of families every week. So between our personal knowledge and understanding of our homegrown children, our years of fostering and also developing a company prior, we are ready to put these skills into place to take this company to the next level. LearningPod has met the seed stage targets and is ready to rocket through its growth stage. We are seeking 3.3 mil in exchange for up to 22% equity in Money Jar Investments Australia. Daniel and I have, in at the seed stage, invested near a million dollars into the LearningPod group. We've successfully been able to tickle those boxes and is ready 
to move on to the growth stage. Below is four different areas in which we will be placing the investment into. One being a board, bringing some additional skills into the board. Secondly, sales and customer service team, a dedicated team to meet the current demand that we're receiving today. And location growth. We've been able to do this successfully in the past. We are looking to increase those locations further. And fourthly, technology. So something that we're very passionate about from developing in the past is software program. So just finishing our current software program to help with our internal company processes. Uh, and we are going to then start the product that will just disrupt the education sector as it seems. We are ready for that and um, would love to talk to you further about the investment breakdown um, in the deal room. Yep. We can see here a list of milestones for 2020. This was planned to be a strategic year to really put the company under pressure and get things done. Some of the things that we do want to point out is um, we wanted to be externally audited. We wanted to be compliant enough to ensure that our company processes, our policies, structure and financial setup was compliant and met all government standards. We successfully done this. We also became approved for additional NDIS categories and we are currently on the process to be approved for two more. But what we wanted to ensure we done is stress test everything. We wanted to try and break the current model and we did that hard. So what we ended up doing is we stress test um, back in August with five locations, 32 staff and 1,000 students a week. But these results really shown as when we headed into our 2021 year, we were already at around about 80% capacity for our education classes. It was extremely rewarding to reflect on what the company was able to do, seeing the results, really putting it under pressure to, to ensure that it is ready for the next stage to meet the demand. And we really wish for you to be a part of that. Learning Pod Spotlight is not just looking to profit from the problem, its plan is to profit more on addressing a solution, which we have. All highlights one to four underline a solid foundation for trendsetters, not trend followers. Growth and exit plan and the roots of the problem. Yeah, we do believe that by investing in money drawn investments, trading as a Learning Pod group, this is a truly solid investment for anybody. I want to highlight four main reasons why. One is that we're innovative and we are ahead of the game. We've been focusing on what is about to happen. Two, we've really secured strategic partnerships and licences to really make that fast growth strong, leaving our competitors behind. Proven scalability. We've stress tested the company. We've, from start, we have built the foundations of the company ready for sale or IPO. And fourth, an investment opportunity to serve a larger market that our competitors have purely just left behind, providing an advantage of multiple interconnecting revenue streams all year round, which just leads to long-term security. We are really here and ready to disrupt the delivery of education as it stands. And we really are welcoming you to come and talk to us in the deal room about how this could be a great opportunity for you to move forward. Thank you for your time and talk soon. Thank you very much. Presenting now is Ventara Virtual Reality, training for healthcare. This company helps doctors and students practice and perfect clinical procedures in VR in order to reduce medical error and save the lives of patients. Here to talk further about this is co-founder and co-CEO, Dr. Nishant Krishnanathan. Hello everyone, my name is Nish. I'm a surgical doctor and the co-founder of Vantari VR, virtual reality for healthcare. We are a B2B SaaS health tech company, which helps doctors and students perfect and practice life-saving procedures in virtual reality. Our vision is to eliminate medical error and save patient lives. Medical error 
costs $1 trillion per year in the US alone. And this results in preventable deaths yearly. Medical procedures are a big part of this, accounting to over 10% of all medical error. The problem, it's a combination of the traditional apprenticeship model, which lacks standardization and is subjective, the use of restrictive and lifeless equipment, such as mannequins and cadavers, and finally, traditional sim workshops which create a lack of access and take away precious clinician time. This results in a two-sided health economic burden, both in the delivery of training and the cost of it, which is medical error and lost patient lives. This is why Vantari VR was born. We eliminate medical error by helping doctors and students practice life-saving procedures in virtual reality. Our software platform is leading edge and is delivered on any VR headset in the market today. It gives users, clinicians and students the ability to perform clinical procedures in a safe, scalable environment and has real-time performance tracking that allows them to know how they went in real time. In addition, we follow college guidelines, which means we can apply our technology all around Australia and internationally. How does our software work? Well, let me show you. Pick up and uncap the lignocaine bottle. Attach the pink drawing up needle to the syringe and then draw up 10 milliliters of anesthetic. Use the toggle on your right controller to move the plunger in the syringe barrel. Detach the pink needle from the syringe, place it safely on your tray and then attach the blue injecting needle. Finally, inject the local anesthetic into the area marked on the patient. Using the scalpel, make a small incision at the marked area. Insert the chest tube into the tract created into the pleural cavity. Attach the chest tube. Review correct placement of the tube on the X-ray. We're creating the new gold standard for medical training. From our inception in 2017, we've grown rapidly to be the number one medical VR company in Australia. This includes partnerships with some of the leading organizations such as RPA Hospital and Westmead Hospital. Our clients are already providing great and powerful testimonial feedback, such as one in Ethicist, who called Vantari the best teaching tool he's used aside from real experience. We're also getting preliminary data which supports our software when compared to online modules and traditional mannequins. We found 95% engagement and 75% retention after using our software. The data just speaks for itself. We've gone from strength to strength since we were incorporated. We've been through Australia's leading health tech accelerators, we've achieved national partnerships, We've got both state and federal grants. We've received international recognition. We've been through our seed round and really bolstered our team. And finally, 
were placed in a powerful way to really grow our national footprint. Our real secret sauce is our rock star team. I'm a surgical doctor and VJ is an emergency doctor. And together we have over 20 years of clinical experience. Dan is our CTO and he has over 20 years of experience in 3D systems, VR and AR. He's worked for leading organizations such as Rio Tinto and Syro. Our talent is the who's who of developers and software modelers. They've worked for huge organizations such as PwC and Marvel. Some fun facts about us. I've played for the Dockeroos, which is like the Socceroos, uh, but nowhere as good. So this is the Australian medical football team I'm talking about. Vijay was once an actor. He featured in the Chronicles of Narnia movie. And Dan, well, he actually famously met the Queen when he built Australia's first haptic bench. Was supported by some of the leading, leading clinical advisors who have international recognition. So we're talking presidents of societies, university professors. We've got a leading medical device advisory panel from organizations such as Johnson & Johnson and Stryker. And we're ably supported as well from a commercialization point of view from three people who have come from both the startup and m and backgrounds. The market opportunity is huge. Our customers are both hospitals and universities and with one eye on the US market. We're a B2B SaaS company, but we believe there's gonna be a real game changer when there's a paradigm shift to B2C, where we can help clinicians and students train at home. So really, that's the Netflix of medical training, when content is provided directly to clinicians themselves. And as you can see those numbers, they're massive. What about the competitive landscape? Well, we stand apart thanks to our focus on critical care, as well as our technology, which features some of the best fidelity and market leading, as well as the interactions, which are mapped to real time and real life medical interactions. So what have we achieved to date? We've got a growing platform, which is rich in procedural modules. We've got four hospital partnerships nationally. And finally, we've achieved a channel partner with a, ma with a major tier one medical device company, which will help us grow our platform, but also with one eye on our exit. So why are we here today? Well, Vantari is asking for $6 million to scale. This will give us a runway of 24 months, help us expand into the US over the next over that period, it'll help us double our team size and build an increasing library of procedural platform, which will help address 90% of the procedures that clinicians need to know. So if I haven't given you enough reasons to join our journey already, let me spell it out for you. We're the number one medical VR company in Australia. We have a scalable market leading technology. We have a rock star team with an ambitious global vision. And finally, we eliminate medical error and save lives. There's no better reason than to join us for that. Get in touch with us now with the link provided below. Thank you. Presenting now is ICEN, an innovative and unique technology-based engineering business who provide quality assured design, documentation, specifications and reports for infrastructure and building projects globally. Here to discuss this further is Director Brad Pape. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are well. My name is Brad, and I'm excited to introduce ISON to you. ISON are a global engineering technology business. We are an innovative and unique technology-based business founded in 2020 by a highly experienced team of engineers. 
We provide quality assured design, documentation, specifications, and reports for infrastructure and construction projects globally. We are different because we are simplifying and streamlining the engineering business. We enable professionals to collaborate when and where they want, part-time or full-time, and in turn value their fee-for-service arrangements. In some cases, our larger clients will benefit by having access to our database of professionals. Clients can instantly choose who they need, when they need their specialist services, and for how long this is needed. Clients enjoy lower costs, quicker turnaround times, a highly motivated workforce from a single organisation. We will become the first and only port of call for all construction and building clients. <clears throat> the engineering services world is highly is worth in excess of 1.5 trillion per annum and is highly fragmented, resulting in duplication, inefficiency, as idle and underutilised people in layers of corporate management, particularly in the larger companies. These costs are ultimately passed through to the end client. We have a solution that reduces time and cost, improves responsiveness, improves utilisation, improves knowledge sharing, improves quality and motivation, and allows for flexibility. It also increases work through the door. The workforce of professionals are supported by an IT platform that will allow for collaboration, improve revenue, cost competitiveness and efficiency. The, the platform consists of a website, intranet and an app that is shared amongst what normally would be competitors. Uh, B2B, business to business. Clients don't get specialist inputs when they need them. They wait for resources to become available. They don't get the people they want and they don't know who is available. Clients pay fees for bespoke design solutions on every job to the way, due to the way the work has been procured. The engineers are often underutilised, learning on the job at the client's expense. B2C. It is quite often the case when residential companies, customers procure services of unqualified, costly advice from third-party inspection businesses that have been, been referred through by the agent. The agent is motivated to move the property in order to receive the commission. Again, the advice will often fall short of expectations. The solution, B2B. Clients can procure engineering services from one global platform, knowing that the service is when they want it and in the time frame they need it. We offer standard designs and fixed fees for designs that should be off the shelf. B2C. Clients can book our services direct with our booking engine, that directly links from a third-party website like realestate.com. Our clients book the, book the time and know the cost. In this case, we can also upsell to our B2B members, for example, structural and fire engineering services if defects are picked up. We allow people to provide services direct to the B2B and B2C markets. <clears throat> There's some additional details there. Um, clients are able to access our database as well. They can see who is available. Quite often clients these days prefer to work with individuals that they're familiar with or that they're comfortable with. Um, B2C, our global mapping system allows for inspectors to travel direct to the site. Um, they can see, we can see where they are in real time. Uh, we provide an unbiased one-stop shop for all services under one roof. Uh, we're a unique, highly scalable, repeatable engineering technology services business that taps into the gig economy. We're able to service the majority of engineering needs. We provide services to housing, residential, commercial, government, NGOs, industrial, etc. The market size. This slide shows some of our competitors. You can see there's WSP, ACOM, Oricon, etc. Uh, reported revenues are anywhere from sort of $2 billion up to $20 billion. Uh, they make, at the lower end of the market, they make up about 15%. Uh, B2C, in Australia, there's roughly 12 million properties uh, available and approximately 5 to 7% of these properties are transacted on every year. Uh, in Sydney, for example, we expect we could pick up, say, 10% of the total uh, residential property market, which is about 14,000 properties per month. Uh, in terms of inspections. Competitor comparison, there's a, a slide showing uh, the differences between us, uh, a small business and a large business. So we basically encapsulate all the positives of the small, bring them into the big and vice versa. Typical multipliers on salary costs for companies are between 1.6 and 3.5. Um, large corporates tend to hover around the three multiplier on direct salary costs. Um, smaller about 2.2 to 2.5, so we're sitting at the 
So you can see straight away there's a cost advantage. There's some of our notable clients. So we're working with government, architects, uh, universities and contractors. Uh, the team is made up of myself and Sam at the moment in terms of uh, our directorship. Uh, we're looking for good people that will add value and complement our ambitious growth plans. Uh, we value diversity. The ask will consider any cash investment in exchange for equity in the business. Um, and we're moving quickly into international markets, so, so we would um, consider strategic partnerships, office space, people, et cetera. Uh, that's a slide showing distribution of funds. Um, timelines, um, we've passed milestone one, so Open Australian Office, we're sitting at uh, 2021. Uh, we're about to sign a MSA with a preferred IT uh, platform developer. Um, we're looking at marketing on LinkedIn soon. We're going to open up our page. We have a little page there at the moment, but it will be opened up to the members to join uh, from LinkedIn and also um, people procuring our services. Um, we're looking at expanding into quantum computing around 2023, subject to IBM uh, advancements there. And we're looking at uh, global revenue of about $50 billion by the time we hit 2024. Um, there's a short-term goals page, so we're currently working through those. We've launched we've launched an app into Google into Google Android. Um, we're about to launch Apple. Um, the next page describes what we're going to do in terms of the real estate websites and LinkedIn. Uh, we're looking at for 50,000 members by June 2022 and a listing on the New York and London Stock Exchanges uh, late 21-22. Uh, we'll, we'll be adding Ison Hub, which is a place for engineers to share their widgets, their software, um, spreadsheets, etc., for, for uh, exchange or for, for selling. Uh, investor highlights, uh, we're a unique business. Uh, we're competing with limited... Uh, old school competition. We will scale rapidly across the globe. Um, clients can source our people direct from our platform if, we, if they want to. Um, we're adding ice and hub soon. Quantum computing will be about five years away. Um, IBM uh, have advised us. Um, our technology will remain with Ison, so there's no other technology in the market like it. Um, <clears throat> it it's actually part of uh, it, of, of what we require to enable rapid growth. Uh, our revenue target is 50 billion. We will achieve 50 billion by 2024 and we're quite excited about it. If you'd like to find out more about ISIN, please reach out to me or feel free to join me in Brella. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Presenting now is Biorhythm. Biorhythm is developing a comprehensive remote monitoring suite for obstetrics, which will improve access to care for expecting women. Here to talk further about this is co-founder and CEO, Amrish Nair. Hi, my name is Amrish. I'm the co-founder of Biorhythm, and I'm thrilled to present this opportunity to, to you today. Biorhythm exists to address the problem of preventable stillbirth and pregnancy complications worldwide. And this problem is not just a problem in developing countries. It exists all over the globe in different proportions. And the reason this exists, we believe, is because of the tools OBGYNs have to solve the problems in current days. They're currently confined to the four walls of the hospital and do not fully utilize the 90% of the time that the woman's actually at home in her own environment. And furthermore, many of these tools in hospital are operator dependent, meaning they require a midwife or an obstetrician. These complications actually cost the medical system and the economy. And there are several costs, direct medical costs, as well as future medical costs, especially since they concern mother and baby. And it's a huge market looking at it in the US as well as globally. And the solution to all of this is really to identify, 
to collect the data, to make sure evidence is protocolized and standardized, and finally, to look at new ways of uh, finally looking at new business models to help suit out a data collection. And with that, we present FEMAM, Biorhythm Solution for Virtual Maternity Care. FEMAM really presents the solution for a virtual visit. So a mom is identified as high risk. She's then prescribed the FEMAM uh, monitoring system where the doctor and the patient would work through a plan for frequency of data collection type of data. The mom then downloads the mobile app and a kit comprising of several point of care devices as well as the FEMAM monitors delivered to her. And for example, if the woman is scheduled for seven times a week monitoring, every Monday morning, um, she turns on the app, completes the questionnaires and the data measurements and submits it, where it's then reviewed by the clinician. The clinician will see this through a clinician web interface where the patients are triaged accordingly to red, yellow, and green. And the highest risk patients are seen first. The star of the show here is really the female fetal monitor and the ability to conduct fetal and maternal monitoring outside the home. And in this case, we have actually redeveloped the fetal monitor to use ECG technology to future-proof it, as well as make it more usable for women at home. And this is a key component, the reliability of data at home, which is an absolute essential for home monitoring. We, all, we do all of this through really three different things that we do in-house. It's the signal processing, which the core team has had 10 years of working experience together, the digital biomarkers of disease progression for pregnancy, which is really about how do we use longitudinal data to better track fetal and maternal health, and finally device design, which allows women to use it themselves without mistake repeatedly. Essentially, what we do is we take an electrical trace on the skin of the mother, on the abdomen of the mother, and convert that into a fetal heart rate trace, which is interpretable by the doctor. Through several studies in Singapore, Australia, and through several prospective studies in the future, we have proved that it's non-inferior, as well as we are looking at changing the standard of care through our device and through home monitoring. We are adopting a business-to-business -business model, a B2B model, where FEMAM is sold into the hospital, and we are monitoring as a service company where the hospital pays us a monthly subscription for a bulk number of patients. In different jurisdictions, hospitals get reimbursed differently by the payers. And this FEMOM system and the monitoring as a service provides value for money in the sense that it now allows unlimited frequent monitoring sessions per month without, with the fixed fee. The platform is scalable to adopt any level of uh, patients that the hospital would like, all the way from their low-risk patients to their high-risk patients using a two-tiered pricing model. And the value that we really sell and deliver is lumped into four categories. Your health outcomes, patient experience, provider satisfaction, and cost management. And this really, these quadruple aims really cover the broad spectrum of what a hospital needs to deliver better value-based care. We've worked with several major key opinion leaders in Australia and the UK who are redesigning maternal and fetal medicine care to allow more mothers better care at home and to be able to identify risk and complications as early as possible. We are currently conducting studies in several hospitals around the world, in Melbourne, Sydney, London, Singapore. And we have investors who have supported our mission. We have partners who have enabled us from day one through quality management systems, business development, business model development. And finally, even looking at MNCs who have supported our journey through the HealthWorks program was Philips, uh, where we participated in in 2019 and our relationship continues today. Moving forward from here, we, Biorhythm have staged the product into a light launch as well as a full pilot. And that's what expected this year. And looking at gaining traction and numbers for the FEMAM light launch, whilst driving the research needed to launch FEMAM as a class two device in TGA, FDA, and the European markets. We are currently closing a bridge round uh, of 1 million US dollars, and we're moving into a series A, where we aim to raise 5 million US dollars in the second half of this year. The bridge rounds funds would be used for clinical research, as well as the pilot production manufacturing, and to drive traction for FEMAM light. In Series A, we're looking to clear at least one uh, regulatory jurisdiction 
and accelerate sales of both Femom and Femom Light. The board of directors found us um, really encompass where we want to go. Um, while capturing the original spirit of the company through Pina, myself, and David, um, we've added directors such as Rajesh, Pierre, and Mark, who bring a financial side of things, but also great MNC experience in how do we commercialize this product on a global scale. And they were supported by a phenomenal team uh, who comprise of business development, quality, software, hardware, engineering, who are spread across three different countries, India, Singapore, and Vietnam. And with that, we'd really like to thank you for al allowing us this opportunity. And together, we can change maternity care. Thank you. Presenting now is Gade Holdings, an energy intelligence advisory platform that assesses and recommends commercial and industrial building owners to a fully financed renewable energy and energy efficient solution. Here to talk about this further is CEO and founder, Azar Offman. Hello everyone, my name is Azar Osman, CEO and founder of Global Analytics Energy Doctor, or in short, GATE. GATE is an energy intelligence platform uh, help to reduce energy costs and minimize environmental impact. It is also an ecosystem where global clients can assess uh, energy solution providers. Now, having said that, the, the solution recommended will be financed by our participating partners. We aim towards being the global energy solution provider, a one-stop solution and a marketplace for others to be part of the global ecosystem in renewable energy and efficiency solutions. The problem we are going to solve are multifold. Uh, we are looking at the wastage of energy consumption leading to billion dollars of losses. The ever increasing demand leads to a rise of uh, utility costs. And the solution provided by the vendors are somewhat silos. You know, They cannot tackle the problem that the client face. So the client is pretty upset. You know, They have more problem than they, they, can, they, they want to, to, to get it solved. So when all these things cannot be put together, the environmental pollution keep on increasing, of course. We have gathered the data, there's an annual loss of 1 billion US dollar per country because of energy wastage, and these losses contributed to climate change as well. So how do you solve this problem? So the solution lies in the technology that we have developed. Now we can gather data from the client, they can download the data into our platform. From the data, we do an analysis of the, of the, of the data given, and then we recommend solution. Now, this solution that we recommend are energy conservation measures that are tried and tested that they can implement into their facilities quickly. Now, they are, since the, the solutions are tried and tested, uh, the savings can be get somewhat guaranteed and uh, most of the partners that we brought in can finance the solution, thus making adoption pretty, pretty easy and quick. Our technology encompasses blockchain and AI solution base thus um, making data collection auditable, uh, auditable and transparent. You can see here at the, uh, uh, the screenshot that we provided, there are three countries that we already embarked in, uh, of course, and then they could select the uh, buildings they are running or owning, and then from there, put the data of the facilities and the consumption of the, uh, of the uh, building. Uh, after this data has been collected, they can quickly uh, go to the next stage and look and, and click on analysis and recommendation or pattern of consumption and generate report. So these are facilities we brought in pretty easy for them to use. What sets us apart? As you can see, we are the first in Asia providing end-to-end -end solution, you know, leveraging on blockchain technology, uh, partners who has AI-driven solution that creates a low cost and high savings and a fully financed solution available in multiple countries. The, middle, the business model is, is uh, pretty clear. Uh, we provide licensing. Uh, there are people or there are companies who invited us to uh, develop a platform in that country. And if we do so, there's a licensing cost uh, that we charge us an assessment report uh, from fifty dollars to $4,000, depending how complex the report that when the data has been uh, put into our system and they can download the report. 
uh, energy and facilities manager can uh, see how good they perform uh, uh, based on a sufficient basis. And of course, uh, most importantly, when the solution implemented, we take between five to 20% uh, commission of the solution uh, implemented to the, uh, to the owner or to the client uh, based on the period that they log in with the five, 10 and 20 years. The market size for energy efficiency is about $300 billion. Uh, the total renewable energy market is about $1.6 trillion. You can click uh, the link to download the report. You can see our customers that we have uh, served uh, in the three countries, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia, are quite broad and, and in, in range in terms of the uh, uh, the different industry they are in, uh, as, as small as a building, uh, to a mall, textile factory, uh, university campus, hospital, and so on. Uh, recently, we have signed an LOI with Four Point Sheraton. Uh, they ha we have done the energy analysis and uh, recommended the solution. The next phase is to implement the solution. Our team comprises of myself and uh, Roland Lim, my CEO, and also the co-founder. And together, both of us have uh, 35 years of experience, uh, both of us in the energy industry, providing solution uh, of customized power generation control. We've done more than 1,000 project export to 20 countries. Uh, supported by Mr. Rahim Tahe, which is an ex-VP of BHL Asia Pacific, his broad experience, uh, we, uh, we are able to tap on the, um, the network that he has, thus bringing more clients to our company. Uh, Ms. Ho Chi Wan is uh, a chartered accountant with 25 years of experience with MNC like Honeywell. And Mr. Anko is a CTO who founded Bliss Protocol, a blockchain technology as well. Supported by a strong technical team, uh, we have uh, certified solar designer, uh, certified energy auditor, energy analyst manager, uh, programmer, and, and we have a team of advisors who have more than 30 years experience in the field of facility equipment and, and power consumption, and through their advice, enhance our platform and thereby giving good solution to our client. The funds that we are seeking is, is, is about $880,000 for 10% share of the company. We have managed to raise an initial fund of $350,000. Uh, and with this added fund, we hope to enhance our platform, uh, uh, increase our manpower, and of course, market the product. At the same time, we realize that R&D is quite critical to our company to keep uh, abreast of new technology coming in. As you can see here, even during COVID, we are still able to do our business. Uh, uh, we did assessment or virtual assessment. And then when the report has been handed over, we do a video conferencing to help the clients so that they know what kind of solution they can implement and what kind of savings they can expect. We forecast to do 700 metric tons of carbon emission reduction, $10,000 savings per month, or uh, sorry, per deal or per building. 40 industrial commercial buildings that you want to do the, uh, the assessment and 10 projects implemented per month. We're looking at three countries right now. We've been invited uh, to go other countries. We are now looking at Philippines, uh, Bangladesh, and so on. Uh, we expect to grow a company in the span of uh, the few years, growing our revenue to $35 million. Having said that, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact me. Uh, my name, phone number and website are listed here. Um, so feel free to do so. Thank you so much and have a good day. Presenting now is Founder, a truly revolutionary new SaaS and PaaS augmented reality product that is first to offer true world-scale AR capability with the ability to remotely place AR content in any indoor or outdoor location. Here to talk about this further is CEO, Lee Dowie. Hello everyone, my name's Lee Dowie. I'm the CEO at Foundat, uh, and it's my pleasure today to introduce this investment opportunity to you all. So what is Foundat? Foundat is a SaaS and PaaS product that makes world-scale augmented reality possible. And it promises to revolutionize AR by resolving all of the current limitations that are currently experienced. So what are those limitations? They, they really come about by the two methods that are used to place AR content into a view, being scene detection and user-placed content. Now, to try and describe scene detection a little better, Current AR platforms view or recognize shapes and images in the environment around you 
so that it knows what that environment looks like and it can place content within that view. The problem is, is that it can be easily tricked with similar shapes or images in a view. So if we look at this example here in a process plant where I'm interested in a particular valve, say, the problem is, is that I, the AR platform can easily re recognise some of the other valves and inaccurately uh, provide operational information or technical information for the wrong valve. Now, as you'd no doubt appreciate, the consequences in an oil and gas application or something could be very severe. So that's, that's a really big downfall that the current AR platforms have. Another downfall is that often in, there's a lot of industries where those shapes and images change on a daily basis because the environment is quite dynamic. So the problem with that is, is that if we place AR content in those environments, um, it actually won't appear correctly so that um, as that environment changes, it'll no longer appear. And there's a lot of expenditure necessary to constantly update and modify. Whereas we've found that uh, none of those problems exist. As you would appreciate, these current limitations uh, obviously mean that there's a lot of reasons why you know, large scale AR content or application in these industry has, been, has not been possible to date. Now, FoundOut resolves all of these issues by accurately placing all augmented reality content in the world so that that bit of information sits right there and that's, that's where it's located. Um, it also resolves all of the other issues with all of the existing AR platforms so that we can have a much more intuitive and natural way for people to explore the environment around them and find whatever it is that they may be looking for. So how do we make this possible with FoundAt? Well, firstly, uh, we have the FoundAt Earth Twin, which is essentially a three-dimensional twin of the entire Earth that also has uh, aerial imagery and three-dimensional models for buildings. But we can also include uh, photorealistic uh, models for the interior of buildings as well. The other element that makes this possible is the high accuracy that we can achieve on the personal mobile device. As you may be familiar with current GPS, systems, et cetera, in a typical city environment, the accuracy could be plus or minus 35 metres or more. Whereas with FoundAt, we can accurately achieve one metre accuracy in any environment, even indoors. So why are we doing that? We're doing that to leverage the human tendency towards spatial cognition so that now the same way that a person navigates their physical environment can be the same way that they navigate their digital environment to find information. So what we're able to do with this now is really provide a compelling alternative to, to traditional digital twin platforms. So it may not be common to compare an AR platform to a digital twin, but given the breadth and power of FoundAt, it's now actually possible and FoundAt really blurs the lines between the two. After all, the two are really just a similar form of spatial data. And as you can see, FoundAt has a lot more advantages and applications than either of the two combined. Now, if we look at all of the industrial applications, FoundAt really provides a really compelling and intuitive way for, for users of any type to navigate their, their environment, to look around and find information that they're looking for, much easier than searching in, in corporate databases under names and filing numbers and all of those sorts of things. But importantly, it's also a two-way flow of information. So all of those companies can gather a lot of really useful information from employees service agents or customers in the field so that if, for instance, I were to raise a maintenance request, I can take a photograph and it's accurately geotagged so that they know exactly where to go and find that out in the field. Now, if we uh, look at some of the personal applications, found that can be equally applied to a range of uh, personal data. If we look at the example with social media, because it's so prevalent these days, um, if a user happens to be scrolling through their social media feed, if they see a particular event of interest, it could be a sporting event or a concert, they can zoom in on that uh, location with the Found Out Earth Twin and they can read only social media posts that are coming from that location. Now, if we take that one step further, say now that that user is actually sitting in that same stadium, they can hold up their phone and they can look around in augmented reality view and they can see those posts appearing in live time so that they can click on them and interact with them. But also that can also be in a historical environment where they can look back into the past and see posts that have been uh, posted by people in the past. Now, it's important to understand that the accuracy of found out is so great that if we take, for instance, a typical restaurant environment, if I was looking around a restaurant, I can actually see who's sat at each and every table. So 
it's really interesting for people to be able to look around and and see who's been there in the past. It could be celebrities or influencers or friends or family, all of these sorts of things. Now, if we consider the ability of Foundat to be able to place content anywhere in the world, we can place some really large scale, three dimensional animated content over any city skyline, over any building anywhere in the world without any access to physical real estate or infrastructure in that location. So that, that produces a really exciting concept now for us to be able to sell digital real estate anywhere in the world for anyone that wants to use large scale augmented reality content for their, for their user base or for their customers. Now, if we look at the market itself, um, found that really is applicable to three main uh, vertic verticals in the market, all worth in excess of 90 billion per annum. Now, we believe we've taken quite a conservative view of that market, and we've suggested that 10.7% of that uh, would be serviceable by the Foundat product, of which we believe uh, 2.5 billion would be an obtainable market share. So all in all, quite an attractive market proposition for Foundat. In terms of the team itself, uh, so, I, I'm the founder, inventor of CEO, and CEO of Founder. Um, I've also had nearly 20 years of experience in the construction and engineering industry, so I'm very familiar with the end user applications and corporate applications. Darren is a really well accomplished software engineer. Uh, Darren's led the technical development of the product from the very outset uh, and is really excited by, by the proposal. Rod is our creative director. Rod is actually based in London. And he's um, an industry professional from advertising. He's really well known for his work in experiential marketing. And Rod's been involved with all of the creative aspects for the product to date. And again, is very excited uh, for the opportunities that found that presents in advertising and the like. Also, Amir is our lead uh, developer on the application. Now, if we look at the raising itself, uh, we're looking to raise 2.5 million in return for a 25% equity holding. Um, we're happy to explain the valuation to anyone that's interested, but in essence, it's really uh, it's based upon projected earnings, as well as um, some recent peer data on, on similar raises in recent times. In terms of the schedule, we'll have a product ready for launch within 16 months, complete with all uh, validation testing on key corporate trials and public segments. Uh, at that time, we'll also look to complete another round of funding for our Series A round. Um, so that we can launch the product in, an, in Australia initially and then moving on to international markets after that. So that really uh, concludes the presentation, but I just wanted to summarise by saying we really are tremendously excited by all of the opportunities presented by Founder, and we really think it can revolutionise AR and also the way we manage data more generally. So we hope that the, the value of the proposal is recognised given that we've got a working prototype, so we've de-risked the technical aspects of the product there's a tremendous amount of advantages offered by the product. So it, it really is a, a step change in terms of augmented reality. And in terms of the market itself, the broad market applicability really means that there is a significant opportunity in the market. As well, we have a really strong protection in terms of our patent and our first mover advantage on the product. So I thank you all for your time. I really encourage everyone to click on the link to our deal room, our deal room below, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Presenting now is Uncharted Power. Uncharted Power develops renewable power plant projects specialising in technical design, project management and development of power plant projects. Here to talk further about this is CEO Fook Kwang Han. Hi, I'm Fook Kwang, CEO of Uncharted Power Private Limited. Today, I'm pleased to share an exciting opportunity with you. We are based in Singapore and our goal is to reduce carbon emissions for power generation in Asia through the development of geothermal energy. What we do is to develop geothermal power plants to own and to carry out geothermal R&D with research institutions. Our project coincides with three goals set out by the United Nations. Currently, Asia is still heavily reliant on fossil fuels for power generation and with developing economies still requiring power infrastructure. 
we should take this opportunity to develop more renewable sources of energy. We believe that geothermal power provides the best sustainable solution to replace fossil fuels and have sufficient capacity to meet the power needs of these developing nations. Geothermal power is essentially to generate electricity through the heat from the ground. Water is pumped into the ground, which returns to the surface heated and turns into steam for the turbines to generate electricity. This steam is then recycled back into water and pumped back into the ground and the process repeats. In this process, no carbon emissions is produced. Going back to our opportunity, our project is located in Myanmar, where approximately two thirds of the country still does not have access to reliable power today. Back in 2016, the Myanmar government commissioned a study to identify Myanmar's geothermal potential. The study found that there are 93 potential sites in Myanmar with this geothermal potential. Our site is one of these 93 locations and we are the first company to have formally submitted and received approval from the regional government to commence the exploration works. Our project site is located in the Kayan state which is located approximately five to six hours drive east from Yangon. When completed, our geothermal power plant will provide much needed electricity to the capital town and the local industrial zone, which are located approximately 21 and nine kilometers respectively from our site. There are already existing power transmission cables along the main trunk road which we will be able to connect to, to transmit our electricity. In terms of our progress, in December 2019, we submitted our proposals with success to both the regional government and the central ministry in charge of Myanmar's electricity. Subsequently, in March 2020, we conducted a public consultation with the local leaders and villages to share our proposals and we received more than 80% approval ratings. After submitting our public consultation findings to the regional government, we received the approval to proceed the exploration in July 2020. Okay, now let's meet the team. Uncharted Power created a joint venture company with Next Geo to form Uncharted Next Geo Myanmar. Together with Safe Haven based in the Netherlands, and top engineering consultants as our local Myanmar partner, we formed the consortium to execute this project. Key members from Uncharted Next Geo Myanmar are myself and my partner, John Park. I am a trained civil engineer and have worked on several large scale underground projects for the past 16 years, taking on the role as a designer, a project manager, and a technical advisor for both public and private sector companies. John is a trained engineering geologist who is an expert geothermal engineer and has been deeply involved in renewable energy projects for the past 25 years. Safe Haven have their backgrounds in oil and gas as developers. Since 2005, they have expanded the portfolio to include renewable energy projects for both power generation and sustainable living solutions. The investment we are seeking is USD $5 million for two phases of the works, namely the exploration and design phases for the power plant. We are proposing for either a loan for over a seven year period or an equity stake within Uncharted Power Private Limited. These terms are still open for negotiation. In terms of the overall timeline, we hope to be able to conclude a deal by the middle of this year so that we can start the exploration and design of the power plant in order for the construction to start by 2023. Our current plan is to have the power plant operational within four and a half years from the start 
of the exploration. Before I end, I'd like to stress the great impact your investment will bring. In the near term, your investment will give more people in Myanmar access to energy. In the longer term, your investment will allow us to kickstart our geothermal journey as we intend to develop more geothermal power plants both in Myanmar as well as other parts of Asia. Together, I hope we can reduce Asia's reliance on fossil fuels and have more clean energy for generations to come. I look forward to meet you and discuss more in my deal room in Chris. Thank you very much for your time. I'm excited to introduce our next panel session, which is focused around Asia investment trends with topics such as the global investment climate and its impact on Asia, the investment methodologies of Asia's leading investment minds, advice for startups, and much more. Panelists for this session include Jeff Chi, who's a managing director of Vickers Ventures Partners and recently just listed their SPAC in the US. Gail Wong, managing partner at Her Capital, who recently just made their first investment. Wee Meng Tu, head of investments at Leone Hill Capital. And Essien Hoi Tong, who's the head of investments at SG Innovate. Fong Jek Gan, who's the CIO of Jubilee Capital Management. And it's moderated by Hui J Lim, who's the founder and executive director at Vision Group. A very good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, and welcome to Emergence 2021. And today, we have a really exciting panel, and we're covering the topic on Asia venture capital investment trends, and we're covering some really exciting stuff in the next couple of minutes. So before I kickstart the panel itself, we would like to have some of our distinguished panels to introduce themselves, and from there, we get a little bit of understanding on the background and what we're in for, for the next one hour or so. So to kick off the entire introduction, can we have Wee Ming to introduce yourself and your firm? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Wee Ming, uh, based out of uh, Singapore. We are a family office back fund, uh, pretty much uh, investing into uh, disruptive technology, and more important is to really look at the skill, how we could back you. Uh, we specialize in patient fund, uh, and pretty much uh, from a risk factor, we strive very hard to work together with you in the long term and create this joint partnership and uh, help you drive beyond the technology world. And um, we've got a AUM of uh, 2.6 billion. Uh, we have been investing across industry, but uh, pretty much we like specific industry like healthcare, sustainability. Uh, we also invest into certain deep tech because of our LP background. So into the space telecom side and uh, uh, pretty much uh, I manage uh, the digital and the sustainability part of the, the venture business. So, um, We'll be looking forward to see how we could uh, work together with all of you ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Weiming. And next up, can we have uh, Gil to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm a managing partner at Heart Capital, and we're a Singapore-based seed stage gender lens VC. So we invest in companies with at least one female founder operating in or entering Southeast Asia. We're here to exploit an arbitrage that we see. Women lead one out of three businesses, yet 3% of VC money goes to female founded companies. And when these companies are funded, they outperform the market uh, in terms of returns, uh, capital efficiency, and exit timeframe. So we're a female led fund. Um, we've been angel investing in the region for a number of years already on the same thesis. And uh, we're currently fundraising uh, our first fund. So Quite a, quite a different uh, stage from some of the folks here. Um, we invest uh, broadly. We have B2B holdings as well as um, a number of consumer type uh, businesses that we look at. 
All right, thank you. And next up, we have Jeff. Uh, thanks, Weijie. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Chi. I'm a founding partner at Vickers Venture Partners. We are a global deep tech firm. Uh, we invest in uh, deep tech around the world. Uh, we believe that uh, that uh, innovation is a global phenomenon, and therefore we need a global base to to uh, evaluate deals from. Uh, I like to describe our businesses as uh, finding breakthrough technologies that solve global problems, because attached to a global problem is a very large market. Uh, also attached to when you solve for a global problem, you are doing uh, something good for humanity. So, so certainly. Uh, on the impact and sustainability side, we're, we're very uh, focused as on as well. Uh, I happen to um, chair and uh, act as CEO for our recently listed SPAC. Um, one of the things that, that is uh, a big trend in the market these days, and I look forward to sharing a little bit more uh, with you guys in a short while. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And next up, we have Fong Jack. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Fong Jack and I'm the founding partner for Jubilee Capital Management. Okay, we're, we're a cross-border venture capital fund started in 2015 um, with um, most of our investors from China and we were positioned to look at uh, Chinese outbound capital uh, entrepreneurs and, and technology that's uh, looking to uh, expand to Southeast Asia. Uh, we invest uh, across uh, uh, you know, Southeast Asian countries as well, including uh, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, and uh, of course Singapore, and some in China. So over the last, uh, we're into our year six right now. Uh, we run two funds. Uh, one is the, uh, as I said, the early uh, venture fund, which we invest in pre-A to early B. And we also have a blockchain fund, uh, which is a shorter time frame. It's a three-year fund. And happened that this year, you know, Bitcoin price have gone up, the crypto market have uh, been very buoyant, and we are at the closing end of our, uh, our blockchain fund, we're looking to, to, uh, to close the fund, and, and now uh, looking at the, at the landscape of looking for new opportunities uh, for the next step. So happy to share more uh, later on in the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, and next up we have uh, Hien Sui. <laughs> uh, thanks, Richie. Uh, Hi everyone, my name is Sien Hui. I think uh, some of you may know me. I've, uh, I'm on some of the other panels at Emergence as well. Um, I'm the head of investments for SG Innovate. We are a global uh, early stage uh, deep tech investor. We are wholly backed by the Singapore government. Uh, and the kind of companies we like to invest in are companies that are adopting emerging technologies to solve uh, global problems. A bit like what Jeff uh, mentioned uh, in his intro. Uh, although we probably invest a little bit earlier than, than they'd probably do. Uh, areas of focus for us, uh, we look at things like quantum technology, we look at uh, areas like agri-food, um, you know, sustainability is obviously a big part of the conversation. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about that later on. Uh, we also look at the biomedical space, therapeutics, you know, um, you know how to address uh, new uh, biological pathways that have been discovered. And uh, you know you can't escape the fact that you know we have got to look at things like smart manufacturing and how to uh, make the world a more uh, you know how to decarbonize our entire economy, the global economy. Uh, you know we have got uh, about 90 old portfolio companies from all over the world, and uh, you know really look forward to having this conversation later on, listening to all the opinions of the other people on the panel. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, just a very by very quick introduction, I'm Lim. <coughs> Singapore, and I run a group called Vision Group, where we focus on future tech of implementing blockchain, AI, and cybersecurity to companies to future-proof themselves. So let's jump straight into the discussion itself. And I guess one of the first questions that I would like really bring out towards the panel is that we have been through a very tumultuous time over the last 12 months. What's your view from a global impact perspective of the investment climate? And how do you think that might actually impact Asia? And we'll kick off our discussion with Weiming to share a little bit on your opinions on that question. So Weiming, you're on mute. All right. Okay. Can you hear me now? So I think uh, this brand new world uh, is giving really a lot of challenges, but yet a lot of opportunities, right? 
And um, fundamentally, uh, for any of this uh, entrepreneur who wants to uh, create championship globally to solve world problems, I think the fundamental is still the same. And uh, for us uh, as investor, uh, we really look at how we want to make sure that there is a sustainable funding uh, to those uh, partnerships that we will back on. And uh, number one, the sustainability in funding uh, is really all coming together with people like all of us, right? So in the past, we see that there's a lot of fun that, uh, that will really be working in a very silo way uh, and look at driving the deals. Uh, I believe personally that, you know, the funding, um, this whole funding path is getting more difficult for many of these VCs. Uh, we are seeing a lot of VCs coming to us to raise new funds. Uh, and But we're also seeing VCs that perhaps some of them will be able to even raise more funds, right? So this whole funding uh, mechanism is uh, constantly changing. And, you know, VC like us, we really have to look at getting ourselves more specialized. I think uh, uh, horizontal play is still important, but vertical play will make a difference. And uh, we think that COVID-19 has changed the way how the market drives, but also how VC will have to behave ahead. Thanks, Joe, very much, Wei And opening up very much the rest of the panel as well on some of the opinions on how tough months um, investment climate really looks like and how um, that's your view on how the global impact might actually impact Asia as well. I, I think I'll take a stab at this one. Um, I, you know, honestly, COVID-19 is something that everyone talks a lot about, you know, and you know, obviously it's done a lot of damage, uh, you know, uh, socially as well as to our own personal uh, freedoms as well, our ability to travel, but it's also created tremendous opportunities. I think the pace of digitalization has accelerated uh, manifold uh, during this period, you know, the adoption of technologies that we thought were going to take years, you know, from autonomous, uh, you know, delivery systems to online payments to, uh, you know, uh, you know the, even ordering food online and all that. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who ordered food online for the first time uh, during this COVID-19 uh, lockdown. And that created huge, uh, you know, uh, that accelerated the market adoption and generally uh, was very helpful for some companies that happen to be in this space. Uh, I think this will continue, uh, this pace will continue uh, because once you've formed a sort of habit to use these uh, services, you don't just uh, turn it off overnight because you realize that there's such a great convenience of it. So uh, people's habits are going to sort of frame the discussions uh, and the economy as we move forward. Uh, the second thing, which I think uh, another global trend, which we have seen during this period, obviously, is uh, you know, from a government perspective, uh, the need for food security. Uh, so there's a lot more emphasis now on, on aspects on, on things like nutrition, yield, and more importantly, localization, because we don't believe that you know, we can rely on the global supply chain of food to always be intact uh, you know, if there's another pandemic. Uh, so that represents another opportunity for players in the market in areas uh, like you know, things like hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, anything that can increase basically nutrition yield uh, you know, within a smaller space. And of course, the whole COVID-19 itself uh, represents an entire ecosystem from manufacturing, research, um, supply chain, delivery, education, you know, uh, you know the, the list just keeps on going on. So I prefer to see the glass as half full and that you know, tremendous opportunities for investment in the coming year. Thank you. And the rest of the panel, do you all have any uh, inputs from Jack? Yeah, I'll just uh, add a couple of points. I think uh, there's three major changes I see from last year, say this time uh, when the COVID just started and all uh, knocking down, circuit breaker is just starting to not, that now exactly one year later. I think three change. One, we say, let's say in terms of the uh, uh, consumer behavior change, I think I agree with what Sienfu has said. A lot of uh, 
consumers are forced to to kind of go digital. So digitization as a major trend has a kind of accelerated adoption worldwide, right? Young and old, whether they like it or not, um, they have uh, to go online. And that has uh, boosted a lot of uh, companies that were still testing out uh, some of their new models in uh, like the online education, online finance, food, etc. So uh, the digitization trend, I think, has been established and is going to continue and accelerate even faster globally. Uh, uh, border border restrictions are, are no longer a major concern. Second trend, I think, is uh, in terms of the sentiment right, uh, among the startup or founders' uh, sentiment. Last year, this time, uh, for the larger part of the last year, I think a lot of companies were badly hit uh, by COVID, especially those that were directly uh, impacted because of lockdown. Uh, like in my sum of my portfolio, they were you know, uh, a couple of them were, were uh, affected affected because uh, of tra- their travel uh, travel related uh, startup. Um, and some events driven kind of a startup. Um, but right now, uh, since the end of last year to now, I think the sentiment has flipped. You know, as kind of people are a lot more optimistic. Startup founders are very optimistic right now because vaccination is growing, going on uh, globally. And I think people are, uh, are more optimistic that uh, now is this year, especially year of the box, right? It's uh, giving a lot more positive push, um, a boost to the sentiment. So I see more companies going, preparing for IPO, preparing for SPAC, like what Jeff is not doing, leading the way. Uh, we see a lot more interest in uh, business combination, like even m and uh, some happening to some of my, my portfolio as well. Uh, so this is a second trend. The third, I think, is investor uh, preference or is, uh, attention, right? Uh, investment preference change. Um, I think right now with the US market, China market, Hong Kong market going very buoyant, except for the last few days when it's going through some adjustment, a lot of investors are going direct into the capital market. They would like to have more direct involvement, uh, control of what they invest in. The EV trend is uh, driving a lot of uh, investor preferences. Uh, now people who invest in Tesla get multiple X, 7X uplift. So this is a lot more faster and better than, than go to a private equity or a VC where the investment period is too long. So I think that's another major change I see. So just to answer, uh, not question, this is my, my observation. Uh, Huiji, if I may add, um, I, I, I think, you know, if you, if you think of VCs as, as investing in um, revolutionary changes, technology changing and transforming um, businesses uh, or the way business is done, um, and, and the pandemic as a root cause to force people to change and a catalyst for change. Actually, uh, on, on hindsight, the pandemic actually hasn't really impacted uh, VC investments all that hard. Um, sure, there have been companies that have struggled through fundraising and all that, but generally, by and large, uh, we've all uh, been beneficiaries of, of, of big growth stories uh, with this transformation of how uh, people, uh, society, uh, consumers change their habits, right? Shen Hui gave a few examples um, of, of that, but the whole uh, online education movement, the whole uh, online meeting movement, the whole uh, e-commerce have all seen uh, great, great uh, impacts. I think there's some other things that that uh, have have really happened as well, and, and one of these things is 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 a, a, a deep recognition on on how closely we as humans are 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 tied to society and this planet, and and certainly you have seen in the last twelve months that that the agenda of uh, climate change, the agenda of sustainability. Uh, has become very, very uh, much in the forefront of, of this, right? And so you start seeing companies uh, in the U.S. If you follow SPACs and all that, a lot of the SPAC mergers have been uh, in EV companies. Um, and as we move towards the electrification of vehicles, as we move towards the electrification of industrial equipment, um, you know, one one uh, as we move to to finding alternatives to single use plastics. These are all uh, things that are beginning to change, and and you know certainly as deep tech investors, we hope to play a role uh, in, in in that part uh, of the of the ecosystem as well. So these are actually quite exciting times, I think, for 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 VCs to play. Thank you, Jeff. Um, any puts on from Gail from your opinions from global impact towards Asia? 
Um, well, we have, we're sort of a pretty unique investment strategy. So in a way, it, is, uh, it, is, it does challenge sort of norms and how people think about VC and the typical sectors or verticals one would invest in. And so, as I mentioned, we are fundraising as well as deploying capital. And, and it's interesting to see the dynamics there. I think on the LP side, um, with COVID and people triaging, um, you know, de- navigating uncertainty in their portfolios, but also upheaval in their own lives, the willingness to look at new ideas is, uh, ha- has been um, a lower last year. But there's definitely been a reset uh, with the new year, some kind of psychological shift. Um, to more risk on this year. You know, we're seeing deals closing. We, we just announced a, a deal today. Um, and there's definitely a lot of opportunity, more, more so than, say, uh, negatively impacted sectors uh, from what we can see. And, and we're, we're really excited about the future of work and what that can imply in terms of building more inclusive societies, uh, which is obviously very important to us from our gender lens as well. But we do see the commercial opportunity there in terms of transforming workplaces, uh, increasing employee engagement uh, with the use of technology. That, that's one of the companies that we are um, investing in. All right, sounds good. So I guess that very much with the pandemic itself, there are companies that might have been negatively impacted And yet at the same time, there are a lot of opportunities out there. So zooming in a little bit more to Asia and towards the portfolios that each of the panel actually holds, uh, please do share with the audience a little bit on what are you currently still investing in right now? What do you think might be the opportunities in the next 12 months? And what might be one key strategy you'll be focusing on that you think might be a winning strategy? So maybe we can start first with uh, Xianhui. Okay, thanks, Vijay. Um, Well, I suppose that's a pretty broad-based question. Um, you know, we will continue to invest in our, you know, the thesis that I mentioned earlier, which is in deep technology. But there are certain areas that we continue to be bullish uh, in. Um, but to better understand why that is the case, we probably have to see the implications of some of the, the global trends that I mentioned before. So I talked a little bit about digitalization and definitely uh, Fong Jack, Jeff, uh, we may... Uh, Gail also alluded to this uh, whole uh, trend was uh, digitalization, adoption of uh, you know, technology for automation. Now, we, we operate within the uh, deep tech space, so our focus is a bit narrower than just a pure automation. We're looking really at the uh, AI space. And, uh, you know, we are saying, you know, if AI is going to be you know, more widely adopted, what needs to change? What uh, else needs to change? Because AI in itself is... Uh, it's definitely not carbon neutral. You know, it consumes great amounts of power. Uh, bigger data sets, you know, is going to cause a lot more difficulty in, uh, you know, in processing. Uh, so we said, you know, there are areas within AI itself uh, that represent opportunities. Uh, things like synthetic data is a big trend in the United States. Uh, the second one is uh, more powerful sensors uh, to collect more accurate, more contextual data. Uh, the third, obviously, is in the you know, the new AI chips that are coming up, low power, uh, higher uh, processing speed, uh, quantum technology also plays in that space, although we don't, probably won't see a quantum chip for some years. And, uh, you know, these are areas that I think we remain very bullish in, uh, and that's just within digitalization. So I'm not even going to talk about all the other areas because there's just so many uh, different spaces that we can talk about. Thank you. And uh, maybe, uh, Gil, would you like to put some inputs on and share what you're currently investing in, looking at, as well as uh, what might be a winning strategy for you? Sure. I, I think our underlying thesis around capturing the consumption um, uh, trend in this region, where the population growth and the digitization and powered by urbanization um, makes, makes this an attractive consumer market. And we've seen and we like things uh, around wellness and health. I think uh, clearly after last year, the access um, to health through technology is is, uh, important. It not only impacts lives, but there's an opportunity um, there. So from it could be from something like televets to 
human medicine uh, and diagnostics as well. Uh, as I think Xianhui said, like there is a barrier has been brought down. So people are now comfortable with um, consuming these services uh, online. And uh, there's an opportunity to distribute to, to this population that has a rising income and uh, high technology adoption. Um, this might be a very feminine thing to say, but I think the, we're also looking at things like human connection because you can, um, we've all had to retreat indoors and find digital substitutes, but there are certain things that are irreplaceable. Um, you know, care, for example, um, isolation of people. Um, so some of this is a wellness health thing, but I think it also speaks to workplaces and um, companies shifting, say, budgets from travel to uh, HR tech type of tools that are going to facilitate connection for a permanently remote workforce. Um, that has knock-on effects, I think, not just for um, a, a workforce of both genders, but for, say, um, employees who might be in transitions, including women in maternity. I think just, just sort of more avenues for engagement and uh, inclusion in the workplace is interesting to us. And I think sustainability has always been um, in, in our, in, in our ra on our radar. Uh, and that will, we, we do see innovation there. Uh, again, raising awareness uh, allowing tools that allow people to measure and uh, engage on that front uh, is a, is an important trend uh, that that we're seeing to start to come to market. All right, thank you. Any input from you, uh, Wimi? Well, we see the opportunities in uh, the whole economic restructuring, and I think uh, you know one needs to be. Uh, remember that you know this whole world is constantly changing. So, if you look at this region, you know this uh, we are all looking at how U.S. behave uh, against China, and uh, there's a lot of uh, like what uh, I think uh, uh, one of the speaker mentioned that you know this whole supply chain reconfiguration. I think it's a very important uh, area where we as VC needs to lo really look at how to deploy this whole disruptive model into this re whole structuring process. I think eventually it's all about boosting the productivity. And I, in Asia, we cannot be living in low cost forever. So I think this is a time where we will be able to really look at how bring forth that technology embracement, transform the whole business from a traditional way into more, I call this high productivity way model and work with uh, the stakeholders in that whole supply chain ecosystem and try to drive a new uh, competitive advantage. So, the Chinese tension, the Chinese U.S. tension, in my opinion, is bringing a lot of opportunities to Southeast Asia. So, I think the the digital front for consumer is very good, but behind that industrialization changes. It's probably also important for us to see how we could bring a venture business into the whole horizon, and helps to accelerate this whole pace. So I'm seeing it from, from that uh, point of view is to really look at how to create new industry out from this restructuring process. Thank you, Wei Ming. Uh, any input from you, um, Jeff? Sure. I think the early panelists spoke a lot, a lot about um, change, right? So, so um, one of the things that, that we talk about uh, the pandemic is is what is life like in the new normal, uh, and and certainly the new normal would would mean things like social distancing, 
uh, things like online education. And, and so you see a whole digitalization uh, uh, effort going on in many, many sectors, right? But I also think that, that it is also important for us as VCs to ask what has not changed, right? And, and in, many, in many cases, there are many fundamental uh, things that will still uh, be needed. Uh, we need to address the arrest of single-use plastic. Uh, we need to we need to transform ourselves into uh, more sustainable and clean energy. Those are things that that are not going to go away, and I think and I think that that there are and so uh, in many cases uh, our investment strategy as a, as a deep tech firm has has really uh, in a way focused on on solving these problems uh, and and uh, hoping to generate great great returns uh, in, by doing so. Um, I think the other thing when you talk about VC investments, uh, uh, not just in Asia, but around the world as well, is is one of the more recent phenomena that we can't ignore is this whole thing called SPACs, right? And, and I'm sure all the panelists around the table have at least one company in their portfolio uh, discussing uh, with a SPAC or, or multiple SPACs as to, as to uh, merging with, with a SPAC and all that. But from a VC portfolio perspective, you will see that all of a sudden SPACs have played a major, major role uh, in providing exit opportunities to, to portfolio companies uh, and have provided alternatives to sort of late stage growth uh, capital raising. So instead of raising your Series C, Series D, you're now able to start negotiating with a SPAC and, and to accelerate the, 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 the time frame to, to go public. Um, a lot of people ask me this question after we listed this back as to as to why and how this thing this thing operates and and if if I may just kind of highlight some of my thoughts around or maybe one of my thoughts around how a spec actually works if you think about it uh, there is historically a, a process that that a company needs to go through in order to to go through towards an IPO right, they hire a bank, they, they do certain things, they get documents done, they get legality done, they file for approval uh, and all that, and, and then they finally go out and fundraise. Uh, that process takes at least six months, and in the, from the time you decide to do it to the time you actually go out to the market and ask for money, the market may no longer be there. So there's, it's quite a risky and an expensive endeavor uh, for companies to go down that route. Um, the SPAC process simply sort of turns it around. Uh, some other company goes out and raise capital from uh, from the market first, and then uh, in a rather short negotiation and shareholder approval process, just just merge the business together with the, with the company that's already public. There are differences in in in, in sort of uh, regulatory risk and exposures and all that, but by and large, the thing that it does is it reduces a lot of risk for all parties involved. Um, companies can get to a deal much, much more quicker than the, in which they can they could before, and I think that in itself opens a lot of opportunities for us as VCs uh, in the in the market, and that kind of is is the, the one of the reasons why we decided to go and list our own spec, uh, and we did that earlier this year. So, so that is really, really, I, I think the 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 game changer. I think in late 2020, early 2021. Um, you know, uh, time will tell whether uh, it can sustain. There are signs of the market overheating already. Um, you know, we hope it can continue to temper. So, because uh, indeed, I think the the instrument and the vehicle itself is actually a very uh, timely and and useful, uh, particularly for Southeast Asian uh, startups uh, who who where where we don't really have that track record of uh, of IPO. So so. We, we, I think in 2020, we'll see quite a few of our Southeast Asian uh, large startups back into specs. Yeah, I think I agree with uh, uh, Jeff uh, because this whole new horizon in spec is really opening up, uh, you know, more funding capacity. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, um, I look at it, the whole investment community is also evolving. And uh, uh, if you look at um, this whole market is, this whole market sentiment now is people are rushing into tech stock, right? So people wants to get directly to invest into technology companies. 
So this this will really give a very broad uh, opportunities for retail investors uh, to participate in those innovations that we have been backing uh, in the venture stage and try to bring them to the next stage. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, sorry, I, I just want to jump in here because uh, this is an interesting conversation on spec. We have a couple of companies that are looking at it. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I like the concept and I think that it's great. Uh, obviously, there's some uh, uh, criticism about you know it being basically pump and dump kind of uh, approach to, to fundraising. Uh, you know, we don't know enough about it to, to make a to comment on that. But uh, I want to get from Jeff because he obviously knows this better than I do. Uh, you know, it's, it tends to be more of a, a US phenomenon. Uh, and in Singapore, at least, uh, I don't see our stock exchange uh, uh, being innovative enough to, to, you know, to, to adopt such uh, uh, regulatory changes to, to allow specs in Singapore. I, I don't know. What, 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 do you, what, what do you say about what, what do you comment? What's your thoughts on that, Jeff? I, you know, I, I, I think it's an, it's an interesting observation that you make because I, I think um, historically the regulators in Singapore have, have uh, very tight control over the IPO process. And in a way, the SPAC uh, releases a lot of that control and passes on it on to the sponsor of the SPAC. So, so uh, but as I do understand that they are trying to rush through some consultation uh, paper to to uh, to test the market really to see if there is uh, indeed a, a take up for this i i actually believe it will be good for singapore if 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 we can somehow have some type of vehicle uh, because it will attract uh, our regional um, our regional uh, unicorns to 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 stay and to list uh, within the region um, and, and therefore grow the ecosystem. So, so we we have an ecosystem that is much more self-reliant than dependent on U.S. capital markets, right? So, if if you if you take a step back and, and look back at China venture, maybe uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, they had that same dilemma. All the exits were actually in in in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, it was really only when uh, the local domestic stock exchanges allowed. Uh, listing of these companies uh, that that uh, that they saw the sort of uh, private equity VC market really really uh, grow. So I think it will be good for the ecosystem if if we 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 do develop that capabilities uh, within Singapore. Mm-hmm. Not sure if that answers your question, Xian Hui, because yeah. So maybe I'll just add a little bit on my on my uh, my uh, my take on the Huiji's uh, question, right? So, so I think in addition to you know, what you guys have shared, uh, one of the areas that I'm looking at and observing is the, along the line of the digitization, uh, especially in the area of a blockchain, right? So the digital asset management uh, kind of team has taken off. Uh, so, you know, and we are seeing in the market now, very soon, uh, okay, Coinbase just filed uh, S1 and, and SEC. And the last round was 8 billion, and, but right now, you know, talks are, you know, talking about uh, valuation as high as 100 billion. So this is going to kind of change uh, a lot of uh, market understanding uh, and interest in the whole space. Uh, obviously, there are more B2C and, and the scale and size is a lot more bigger. Uh, but it's also uh, bringing alongside with them other uh, digital uh, concept, digital assets uh, uh, teams that are coming on board. And along with the SPAC team as well, uh, we saw Last year, uh, Diginex, you know, one of the uh, SPAC uh, that was uh, listed, and they were also trying to target the digital asset management space, uh, but they went on on a listing without revenue. Uh, and today, there are other more mature uh, digital asset uh, players with some revenues, and, and some of them are even profitable. So in my portfolio, actually, we, we do have a couple of uh, uh, these uh, digital asset players, even including security token exchange, uh, two of them in Switzerland have got a new license, right? One, one of them called Stefanstein has got a license from uh, FEMA uh, in Zurich uh, to act as a FinTech, like a, a private bank. And another got a license from Liechtenstein uh, uh, not to, to, to be the crypto exchange. And Singapore is also you know, uh, moving alongside in this uh, digitization process. They're embracing blockchain. They're issuing out the digital token uh, payment uh, license. So 
I think with regulators coming on board and the capital market embracing uh, the sector, I think 2021, we will see many more uh, of such uh, assets uh, that's coming onto the market. So I think this is an area that I've, uh, my fund have invested and continue to monitor uh, into this sector. Another sector, I think maybe just a small mention here is uh, in the area of digital infrastructure, the more heavy assets and uh, uh, data centers, edge computing, cloud computing, uh, even in the smart manufacturing, um, you know, uh, IoT, 5G, robotics. These are the areas that are you know, traditionally not so consumer focused, but they are essential digital infrastructure that needs to be in place. And I think um, um, while it used to be more uh, private equity driven or strategic investor driven, today there are uh, some opportunities available for uh, industry or vertical focus uh, VCs to get involved. So these are the two areas I would just share a bit more. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you very much, Fong Jack. From spec models to watch digital assets and Bitcoin. So just following up a very much um, a, a common question, uh, very much to Fong Jack, uh, since you're on this particular topic, for what's your view on the digital assets economy or cryptocurrency economy in Asia? There's a couple of movements uh, globally around the world. You shared a little bit on Singapore. Do you think that's going to be a space that it's really going to grow significantly in Asia? Or what's some of your thoughts on that? I think in Asia, that's the, the, the strong is yes, it's going to do, uh, continue. The trend will continue and it will only grow. With more uh, uh, countries, regulators embracing uh, the sector, um, more consumers, retail and, and even corporates will start to embrace uh, this uh, uh, cryptocurrency. Well, we have already seen in the US, uh, Tesla you know, well, putting aside uh, some treasury to buy Bitcoin. More and more companies are putting aside some treasury uh, allocation to get into the space. So in Asia, we are actually um, a beneficiary and be, there are a lot of uh, adopters. Now in the past, uh, when Bitcoin was, uh, or the cryptocurrency was very hot during the ICO days, 2017, uh, uh, a lot of ex cryptocurrency exchange were not regulated, not the likes of the Binance, Poppy, right? A lot of uh, uh, companies, ICO companies who, who issued the tokens, they attracted a lot of uh, users to, who traded on the unregulated crypto exchange. But uh, you know, with the um, with the Bitcoin price going down uh, to a low of 3,000, Six last year and now backed up to a you know, high of 58,000, 58, the whole sentiment have changed. And so, as I mentioned just now, with um, uh, companies like uh, Coinbase going for major listing, uh, I think going forward, uh, more as more and more uh, this uh, digital service uh, provider, cryptocurrency companies, uh, uh, provided that are regulated by, by the countries, the more adopters, more adopters will come to the space. And we already seen DeFi, right? DeFi that's uh, taking up uh, a lot of interest in the last uh, two years. Uh, today, uh, traditional companies are looking at how to tokenize their assets, how to embrace uh, this economy and make it work and, and to even raise a lot of new funding for, for their business. So I think this trend will continue, will only continue and we'll see more and more exciting models coming up to the market. Thank you, Fong Jack. And the next question very much to Gil is, do you see a specific trend for say female founders or so-called that are really good in specific industries or does your portfolio actually look into specific industries that uh, women co-founders might naturally just do much better than men? I'd say yes and no. I think the obvious, um, the obvious area where female founders have an edge is the consumer space. You know, women make up almost 90% of consumer buying decisions. And that not only includes for themselves, but and for their families from healthcare to education. Um, so I think when you have females on the team, it, it, it just is the, they see the commercial opportunity. Um, they're much closer to it. There's no need to explain the problem to the investor and um, they understand the end user. So, so that's one element where it is very obvious, but we do see the gender lens in playing out in a more subtle way. Um, for example, in the B2B space, that's that's also important, right? And I think if we zoom out and talk about the future that we want to live into and the, the innovations that are going to disrupt our lives, 
um, well, we need to design it with both genders or multiple genders in mind. Uh, and, and there are many historical examples uh, where, you know, there was a missed opportunity for half of the end user market um, because an iPhone was too big for a woman's pockets or um, voice recognition was trained on 80% male data. So um, these are a bit more subtle and under the surface, but I think it's important to have female innovators um, in the early stages of a company. And of course, we, you, we may all, well, maybe not, but what I see a lot in terms of data is that female leadership at all levels not only generates the financial upside, but it builds healthier work cultures. There's a fo greater focus on sustainability. Um, and th those are kind of our, you know, we've got 10 years to address, address these problems. So uh, I would say there's a very straightforward gender lens, but also um, far more, far more, far reaching, a more far reaching um, approach to it. Right. Only for, and then one, one, one more example I'll throw in is, you know, if you talk about in, uh, innovating HR tech, uh, only a woman who has been on maternity leave and locked out of a company email after 60 days uh, knows the impact of what it means to have a distanced employee, right? And the likelihood of that employee coming back uh, if you were connected um, is far higher and the ROI for the business for the employer um, is also uh, significantly higher. So I think perspectives like that uh, can only be innovated by um, women, but, but then it has far, more far-reaching impact to say, people on mental leave breaks, to remote workforces, because, um, you know, I think large companies are going to have a permanent shift in terms of their footprint. Uh, and what does that mean long term for your HR strategy and people strategy? Perfect. Thank you. So in our audience, we have quite a number of investors, but on the other side, we do have quite a number of startups and projects that are looking to fundraise as well. So open up very much to the panel. What's your view on companies that's planning to fundraise in the existing climate? Do you think it's changed or how has it changed or has it not changed at all? And in your own specific investment mandate, what would you typically like to see different um, from previously before to currently right now? Probably you can start first with Weeming. So we, we are family office back fund and um, we really look at uh, helping those uh, entrepreneurs in the long term. So my advice to the entrepreneurs, the founders, still the same is that, you know, uh, you have to really look at the whole journey and how can you really create the championship model uh, the good thing that uh, I've been working the past uh, 12 months is that there's more of these family offices coming to me and uh, we have formed a, a kind of like consortium uh, and MBS has been playing a very proactive role uh, that putting all of us in the FO circles. So the family offices are beginning now to also invest, aside of investing into fund, also taking a direct investment. So uh, I my take is that there's going to be more of those family offices putting about 2 million, 5 million kind of check size like us. Uh, and I think if uh, we are able to bring together, together with the VCs, then the check size can be larger. And therefore, I think the founders, I think they should have to also get in touch with more family offices uh, to really find out how to raise funds from uh, this new investor group. Thank you, Weeming. And from the rest of the panel? Happy to jump in here. Um, I think on the practical side, Despite Zoom, uh, we are seeing deals taking longer to close. Um, 
people just need time to get comfortable, right? And there's no replacement for that in-person touch. Uh, similarly, rounds seem to be having larger number of investors. Uh, we, we see proven founders still needing sort of a, a large, uh, you know, between five to 10 uh, investors in a round. Um, so there's pressure on check size and, and hence uh, a much larger number of investors. And I think that does mean you need to think about for founders strategy for managing that, that sort of uh, cap table uh, and distribution. But yeah, these are, these are practical things, meaning you have to start earlier, you have to cover um, a, a broader range of prospects, um, perhaps family offices too, uh, to Wee Ming's point, uh, depending on, on your sizing. I was um, catching up with one of my former founders. Uh, we, we, we managed to successfully exit the deal. Uh, he went off and did something else for a while. And then uh, part of that, uh, part of that thing was, was uh, sort of uh, helping another startup uh, raise and eventually exit it as well. But he was, he was um, telling me the challenges that, that he had. And I think that experience uh, might be helpful for a lot of the founders. So, you, you know, there's nothing like being in a room with a, with an investor because, uh, especially for charismatic founders, they know how to manage that room. They know how to manage their audience. They can feel the body language. They can sense the body language. None of that comes across on Zoom. You have no idea what the other guy is thinking. And and you know, you, you, an example would be just look at the uh, uh, the screen uh, that we are on today. We have fairly sort of um, faces looking back at you without much uh, body language and an indication as to whether there's interest or not. So I think the, the challenge is really founders need to think through um, in a virtual setting, in a, in, a, in a Zoom meeting, how they are going to carry, get that charisma across to the audience. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, methods that people can use, understanding at what point uh, video is important, um, you know, one of the things that, that I know another of my founder does is he almost, he doesn't force, but, but he puts a lot of pressure on the, on the other side of the room to turn on the camera. Because when he sees a face and he can respond to whether the guy's nodding or frowning or, or, and, and all that. So, so I think the interpersonal dynamics over a virtual conference is, is something that, that founders need to really hone their, their, their skills on. And then the second thing I think for later stage companies really, you know, you know, talk to the VC firm that invested in you uh, or, or go talk to an investment bank because I, I, you know, one of the trends that we are seeing on the market is that, is that um, soon there'll be more SPACs than deals uh, and that, and that uh, it, it's going to be a seller's market out there for, for late stage uh, companies. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring my two cents worth on this. I totally agree with Gail and Jeff on uh, firstly that definitely the uh, the time to closure is taking longer, uh, and part of it could be as a result of having to go through Zoom. I mean, for us, we have, we are taking longer to do our due diligence because a lot of the stuff we do is lab based, and you know we have got to see the labs, we've got to see the manufacturing facilities uh, to get a certain comfort in it. Um, totally agree also on the charisma aspect of it. Uh, a lot of the founders that uh, we have invested in are charismatic founders. Uh, that comes across when, they, when we meet with them. And because of that, to a certain extent, we sort of gloss over some of the gaps within their, uh, you know, their, their proposals and within sometimes even their financial statements. Uh, but when you're doing Zoom, everything becomes very dissociated and we really start to go into very specific areas of what's the market sizing, opportunity, um, and sometimes you don't even look at the technology, which is very surprising given that we are a tech uh, investor. You know, we, we like to say, you know, it's always about Occam's razor. You know, we look for the simplest solution to solve the problem, uh, not the technology. So if your technology is the greatest, but you know, it's the most complex way of solving a very simple problem, then we probably won't be putting money into it. Um, so I think uh, that simplistically is how we are looking at uh, the market today. Thank you. And your views, uh, Fong Jack? Uh, I think 
I would just add that uh, the expectation management would have to change um, on both sides, right? So from the founder side, um, right, maybe you know, they, they would need to spend a bit more time to, uh, to communicate through multiple channels. I mean, Zoom is just one channel. Um, now through, uh, through other networks, I mean, you, it's, it's in Singapore case, at least you can still meet up in a, in a small group. You can still have that face-to-face -face meeting. And uh, you can reach out to a uh, different type of uh, investors because uh, VC, uh, more institutional VCs uh, kind of investors would have a more rigorous uh, investment uh, duty requirement. Uh, and with uh, no other, say, uh, uh, angel investors or high number of individuals or so family office or multi-family office, uh, sometimes the dynamics uh, is a bit different, the requirements is a bit different. So uh, for founders, they, they have to kind of approach different uh, investors to, to see which one would make sense for them. And obviously the investment decision-making process is also different. Um, uh, and now with a very buoyant capital market, uh, um, the attention span and the preferences of uh, investors is also a bit more uh, kind of uh, diluted, right? So for founders, they need to know that um, when they get someone that's uh, fairly interested in them, they need to really you know, nail it in as soon as possible if they can. Otherwise, the attention will be you not know, distracted to, to to other investment assets. And the other one last thing will be just to see whether they can find a few that are more aligned uh, with them in terms of the, uh, the the philosophy, the mindset, interest in the sectors, and just work with a few rather than to go too wide, you know, and and, and talk to like you know too many investors. Otherwise, you no, know, the founder will get distracted and you may get confused and work with a few that can be that's willing to go with the founder for a longer period of time yeah that would be that would be what i would suggest yeah. that's it thank you very much Fong Jack. so we really have an interesting panel session today talking very much from spec models to cryptocurrencies to sustainability deep tech food so as you're conscious of time if there's going to be one key parting note that can provide to our audiences, whether it's it founder or whether they're an investor, what do you think would be that one key parting note that they can keep in mind for the next number of months? Maybe we can start first with Gil. Um, I'm going to get on my soapbox here. Uh, <laughs> I think I would invite investors to open their minds. Um, there is a lot of deep historical uh, expertise along sector um, verticals. And, you know, with what we're doing here, it's, we're first movers in the region, uh, but we're really, Asia's really behind um, Europe and the US in terms of GLI. And so maybe five years ago, there were a handful of female-focused funds in the U.S., and now there are 50, right? And the growth in um, a space like that, uh, Asia is the blue ocean. And so it does require creativity, but I think that's the, um, that is one approach that's needed to see the future. Um, and, you know, aside from the self-interest here, I, I think that in, in general... There's a, I, I would invite even my colleagues here to think about how you practice VC in a way that um, can serve all and serve all end consumers as well. Thank you, Gil. If I may add, uh, just jump in with my, my, my take, right? I think I will appeal to both founders and investors and larger community to rethink what is definition of value. A lot of times we look at value creation, uh, but in, in I mean, you can probably say it's human nature or just self-interest. Value creation has sometimes been subject to very short-termism, short-term thinking. You know, very charismatic founders could, who has done it many times in creating business, sell it, you know, redo it again. Uh, you know, the, the, the value is should be just, shouldn't be just monetary value, right? There should be something uh, that we can, uh, both investors and founders, when we create value, it should be something that can be left behind for the for the world, for the for the social community, for for the economy at large. It's not just monetary value, 
right? Uh, we need to create value on a sustainable basis and some value that can uh, that can uh, you know help industry to uplift themselves or the economy to uplift themselves. Uh, and 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 then we just need to resist some of the temptation from from short term value creation opportunities. Um, yeah. yeah, so that that would be what I would say. So look for I think if we can look for uh, founders who can create value on a longer term basis, broad base, and some useful impact they can create uh, beyond monetary. I think that will be very that will be very good. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Feng. Over to you, Ken. Sure. Um, it's a new world we live in. Um, so, so what is life like in the new world? I think I think founders, investors need to recognize uh, things will be different moving forward, but also be cognizant that some things don't change and some things will be the same. And as you're investing or as you're starting your new company or as you're exploring new opportunities, uh, I think it's, it's, it's important to be cognizant of what's new, what's changed and what's not. So what has not changed is relationship. I think uh, it's very important that founders will continue to learn how to build relationship with uh, stakeholders. And don't just go to investors when you need the money, right? So, you know, wherever you need anything beside money, you can always give us a call, drop us an email. And, you know, pre-COVID, I think we have talked about this before. We like to have beer together. And I think uh, we should, you know, uh, uh, anticipate to have more of these virtual beer sessions to talk through things. And I think that's probably, in my opinion, very key to sustainable relationship so that, you know, you'll be able to get the right resources at the right point in time. It's, it's always fun to be the last one and, and, and at the end of the session because everyone has said all there is to say already. Um, but, you know, the truth is it's almost a cliche uh, when people talk about how the world's biggest companies were all created during times of crisis or inflection points in uh, humanity's uh, long uh, history. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that's going to be the truth as well for COVID-19, you know, if you're an investor, there are great things that can come out of this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in terms of the companies and innovations. If you're a startup founder, if you align yourselves to uh, the global trends uh, in the new normal uh, that's been alluded to by Remain, Jeff, Gail, and uh, Fong Jack, then I think, you know, there are tremendous opportunities, both as founders and investors. So looking forward to deploying more capital and looking at new ideas. Indeed, in times of crisis, great opportunities and innovations do arise. So thank you very much to all our great panelists. I'm sure all the audience will definitely benefit from the insights they provided to them, both founders and investors alike. Looking very much forward to connecting with everyone moving forward, as well as all the audiences in Emergence 2021. Thank you once again, and looking forward to an exciting, exciting future and beyond. Thank you. Coming up next, he's Wei J Lim, who's the founder at Vision Group. He'll be talking about the growing investment opportunity in data companies, and as he refers to it, the new gold. Hui J Lim is a seasoned entrepreneur who has listed companies not only in Australia, but also in the UK. He's also the founder of a Neo Bank and has been successfully building his own venture over the last two years. Welcome, Hui J. A very good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone globally. Firstly, a very big thank you to Wholesale Investor for inviting me to share the topic investment opportunities in data companies, the new goal. I'll be covering on three key topics today. Firstly, looking at investment trends of the past few years and how has markets really been doing? Secondly, we'll be zooming down into the last 12 months. How has COVID really impacted the markets and how are we doing? And lastly, we're looking at the next 12 months 
the next 24, or very much into the future, what might be key opportunities that we can explore and look into? Without further ado, let's jump in into our first topic of investment trends. If we look between the period of 1990 to the year 2019 and study a few different markets, we don't see that the US, specifically the S&P 500, has been increasingly accelerating at an unprecedented rate when they were sub 500 before the 1990s, all the way to surpassing 3,000 in the year 2019. Looking at some of the few key crises that we have experienced, we're able to see how the equity markets been performing, underperforming, or doing really well over the last number of years. We can then take a look into Germany, DAX 30, where the market's been increasingly accelerating equally well, as well as Canada, Markets like Japan or the UK on the opposite end has not been performing that well over the last number of years. Zooming a little bit closer towards the year 2020 itself, we are still able to see comparatively in the US market that the market still increasingly accelerating, even though we are fundamentally as an economy not doing that well what's actually happening in all these markets. Other markets, where is it in Hong Kong, Singapore, EU, Australia, or Japan, has all equally been increasing as well. So if we zoom into some of the casualties and winners in the year 2020 itself, due to COVID pandemic, there are large companies that has actually went bankrupt. And on the left-hand side, we look at 10 industries with the most amount of bankruptcy filings just in the year 2020. F&B has been impacted greatly. The construction and supplies, real estate, healthcare and medical, oil and gas and retail spaces as well. Specifically, companies very much customer fund facing that relies on customer visiting their retail store or interacting with them in order for their business to operate. We look at the Hertz Corporation, a company that's worth more than $25, $24 billion that went bankrupt just in a matter of months during COVID-19. Amongst a whole list of other enterprises that are huge and companies that we have a household name for that has actually went down under. Yet on the opposite end, the companies that actually changed their business model and transformed in the year 2020. And these companies do much better than they would have if they didn't change. And some companies performing even better than their existing business model. We see that the retail e-commerce sales on a worldwide region with Asia Pacific contributing a huge amount and e-commerce stated to continue booming and growing for the years to come. Just in the year 2020 itself, looking at close to 18.4% growth. There are companies that has explored how are they able to repurpose the production or looking at enhancing their business model, or exploring the path of a digital journey to digitize themselves. Specific companies that have leveraged upon the trends that COVID has hit. So, for example, we look very much at Boohoo. People are buying more homeware, and hence, they move their focus very much to selling working attire tops for customers to look, to look smart on Zoom calls. Or Toniska, where from a traditional way of hiring a trainer and working out in the gym, they now have transformed the way people exercise. 
looking at 88% growth just during lockdown itself. Or Stitch in Story, where stitching online and teaching people how to stitch through an online platform has shown an 800% increase in sales during lockdown. These are companies that are not as large as others like Louis Vuitton or Asia that they themselves have very much successfully digitized as well or look into enhanced business models within the COVID period. So looking back very much at what has happened over the last 12 months, where the equity markets has continued to grow and there are companies that are huge that has failed, yet there are other companies that has leveraged upon the COVID period to make a difference and to digitize and come out stronger. The key question to us really is what is to come in the next 12 months? And to look at technology trends, sometimes to move into the future, we need to take one step back and look at the past. We study the last 200, 300 years or so, we're able to identify that there are multiple magnitude of technology breakthroughs in each different era. Where is it from the phone to the personal computer to the mobile phone? With each technology breakthrough, it brings forth massive amounts of opportunities for people to capitalize on and for people to make money. And one of the key things that we have identified in addition to the rapid involvement of technology is that today, more and more so, people are adopting technology much faster. If we take a study of the number of years where certain key inventions were adopted by 25% of the US population, we're able to see that it took 46 years for electricity to be adopted, followed by 16 years for the personal computer. And more recently, with Pokemon Go, it just took 19 days. Can you imagine that? 19 days for 25% of the US population to adopt this key technology or application. We today are living in a world that's accelerating, interconnected, and we are able literally to reach out to the whole world through a click of a button. With this, we also study over the last 20 years of internet giants from a period of 1998 all the way over the course of the next 20 years, what has really changed for the top 20 internet giants? And some of the key findings that we've identified, if we break it down by a five-year basis, between 1998 to the year 2003, more than 30% of the top 20 companies have shifted hands. And more so, as we move forward each five years and we look back, 20 years later, there's less than three companies that was in the existing list in 1998 that's still around in the top 20 list in 2018. So what does this really tell us? It tells us that if we do not constantly remain relevant, if we do not constantly embark upon technology changes, we would be left behind. So looking back very much to the trends and what history has shown us, the next question really is what's going to happen in the future. So we today are really in an era of data explosion. 90% of the world's data was created in just the last three years. And because of this, a lot of companies are ill-equipped to handle this amount of data explosion. In fact, a lot of companies still have no idea the amount of data that's being created every single day. Companies that are ill-equipped today are facing more and more issues. And let's just take three use cases as an example. 
$600 billion of loss due to online frauds and scam just in the year 2017 alone, we are living in an increasingly less trustful world. Every single day, every single second, each person is creating 1.7 megabytes of data. We are living in an increasingly noisier world. And there's an increase in cyber attacks of more than 600% just in 2017 alone. We've estimated $6 trillion, which will be lost, forecasted in the year 2021. We are living in an increasingly insecure world. More so due to the COVID pandemic and lockdown. Not only have we faced the previous three issues, we today are seeing an accelerated trend due to a few key circumstances the rise of cloud computing. Cloud computing spending has rose more than 37% to $29 billion just in the first quarter of 2020. There's an increased amount of data usage where the usage on broadband data has increased by 47% alone just during the lockdown to an average usage of more than 400 over gigabytes per user per household. And the demand for digital transformation is ever increasing. Value at close to a trillion dollars in the year 2020, growing at a rate of 18.5% year on year till reach 2.74 trillion by the year 2026. COVID indeed has driven an accelerated trend for adoption and digitization of both companies, business models, and users at large. So what happens to companies who fail to protect their data or fail to utilize their data itself? What's the impact very much on them? Loss in business, on average, is looking at $40 million for a million data records lost for data breach. Some crazy interesting facts is that it takes about 200 days for a data breach to be detected and another 165 days to contain the breach for a survey that was done on Fortune 500 companies. Can you imagine one year just identify that there was a breach and to contain that breach, how much sensitive data will already have been lost? And loss in value, for companies that are listed, when they disclose their data breach, on average is 7.27% on their market cap. For a billion dollar company, that's a huge loss in terms of their equity capital price. How about failure to utilize data? On average, it's a loss in business of 15 to 25%, 25% less revenue and 10% more cost. Imagine being able to increase your revenue by an additional 25% or to reduce your cost by another 10%. How much would that be in absolute terms to you as a business? So looking at companies today that are addressing these few key issues in the areas of data trust, in the areas of data clarity or the areas of data security. If you were to take a sample of some of the companies that might have listed or raised their funds or have performed in the stock market, what would they actually look like? Companies that are riding on this trend that has really focused on the data area of technology. One use case example, of course, was Snowflake, where their data cloud company, powered by advanced data platform providing software as a service to the clients. They raised $3.4 billion just not too long ago, making it one of the largest software IPO in history, even amidst this current COVID climate. 
That's CloudStrike, where their stock price increased close to five times over the last one year to more than a market capitalization of $48 billion. Imagine if you were an investor in that just one year ago. Databricks, more private company that's raised more than a billion dollars in funding from a few prominent corporate investors, which value them at more than $28 billion. These few companies focusing very much on the data aspect of things and doing really well as more data is created and more companies need to protect themselves in the areas of data. So what would we really look at for the next 10 years? Yes, we are today in a COVID pandemic situation. And over the course of the next 12 months, we're able to see that there's opportunities, there's investment opportunities that we can invest into that will make investors money if you make the right bet. But after COVID, post-COVID, what would be the opportunities or companies that will outlast COVID and continue to do well? If we look at some of the key trends around data, if we talk about the four Vs of big data from volume perspective, where today that's more than 2.5 quintillion bytes of data created, that's like 18 zeros. More and more data will continue to be created from a volume perspective. The second V in the areas of velocity, where just looking at the New York Stock Exchange, that's more than one terabyte of trade information happening during each trade session. How more so this increase in the next number of years? If we look at a variety in the different forms of data itself, 30 billion pieces of content are shared on Facebook every month. In 2014, it's anticipated that it's more than 420 million wearables itself, just focused in the areas of health monitors. In the area of veracity or uncertainty of data, this is costing US economy around $3.1 trillion a year itself. If you are looking at companies that is able to address some of these key issues and trends that will continue to increase and accelerate, it might be something that's interesting to look into. Areas of blockchain, there are more and more enterprises adopting blockchain technology in the next 12 months. And more so after the next 12 months, looking at blockchain as trust by itself, we're able to see that multiple different large enterprises cross multi-locale, cross multi-industry are looking at multi-use cases from banking and finance to supply chain to healthcare, insurance, energy business, real estate. More and more so, they're looking at how they're able to implement blockchain for trust, for data trust, so that we can better have assurance over the data that exchange hands across organizations, across applications, and across people for years to come. And one of the key trends globally as well is that if we look very much at government sectors, more and more so, the central banks are looking at how are they able to launch their own digital currency, of course, with China leading the way, incorporating in their blockchain services network, as well as the digital currency electronic payments. Imagine in the next number of years, there's a high chance that enterprises who would like to deal with China would probably need to integrate towards their current existing systems just in order to trade or to operate in China itself. More so in the US, we have heard of the Facebook project Libra, where they're looking very much at a simple global payment systems and financial infrastructure that empower billions of people. 
a bit closer to home in Singapore, where the Money Authority of Singapore has looking at multiple different initiatives where they're able to then launch their central bank digital currency. And of course, our national carrier, Singapore Airlines. So companies that have really succeeded in areas of digital transformation, in the areas of technology, have been doing really well. This might be one of the key sectors to look into. And specifically, companies that handles data. In my personal view, for enterprises and companies that would like to future-proof themselves for the years to come, there'll be three core technologies that will be critical to their success. Blockchain for data trust, AI for data clarity, and cybersecurity very much for peace of mind and data security. And I personally feel that all three core technologies are integral to each other. Yes, today we are able to place some forms of data on blockchain. We might have information that's highly trusted, but if we do not know how to use this data, if we have no means of being able to pull out actionable insights from the data we have, then the data will not be of much use by itself. Or today, if we run our data through a really sophisticated AI engine, and we are now able to pull out a lot of sensitive data, but if we did not protect our data and hackers get their hands onto our sensitive data, that would be highly detrimental to the company itself. By implementing blockchain, AI, and cybersecurity, we are really very much able to look at how companies are able to better protect themselves. We today are living in an era where data is the starting point and not the end. If we look for investment opportunities in the next number of years and for the future, that is past COVID, that is pandemic proof, data might really be the new goal. On a separate note, for companies who would like to find out how ready are they to adopt blockchain or cybersecurity, we do have a blockchain readiness questionnaire or cybersecurity readiness questionnaire that you'll be able to take that allows you to better see where are you on the chart of being able to top these two core technologies. As a closing note, this is Lim from Singapore from Vision Group and wishing you investment opportunities, looking at data companies where data might really be the new goal. Thank you. Our next panel session is, it's our cryptocurrency and blockchain investment trend session. Now this session is gonna be covering topics such as the future of Bitcoin, creation and predictions for stable coins, the future of traditional financial institutions, and the disruption of decentralized finance. Now our panelists for this session include Henrik Anderson, who's the CIO at Apollo Capital, Fran Strainer, who's the founder and chairman of Tekami Limited, Steve Bellotti, who's the CEO, CIO of Digital Native Assets, and Lee Travers, who's the executive director of Digital X. Now our session is moderated by Lior Groen, who's the principal at Blockchain Valley Ventures. So good afternoon and welcome everyone to Emergence 2021. My name's Leo Groen and it's a pleasure to, to welcome you here to our session on crypto and blockchain. Uh, so joined today with uh, four of, of some of the industry experts uh, across Australia, New Zealand and Singapore uh, to dive into what I think is probably one of the most interesting uh, markets uh, in 2021. Uh, so I'm glad we have the opportunity to dive into some of the topics today. Uh, by way of background, um, a principal at BBV, which is a Swiss Singaporean venture investor uh, investing in and around the blockchain and crypto ecosystem. Uh, and really excited to welcome um, our guests and panelists today. So. Uh, please, I'll hand over to you, Henrik, and, and you can kick us off. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having us here today. And thanks for moderating, Lior. So my name is Henrik Anderson. I'm the CIO of Apollo Capital. So Apollo Capital uh, is a crypto fund um, that has been around for three years, one of the oldest crypto funds out of Australia. We actually managed two, two funds, but our flagship fund 
uh, has a multi-strategy focus. So we invest across the crypto ecosystem, everything from primary deals to secondary market to shorter term uh, trading. So that's us. Brand. Oh, hi. Sorry, I want to go next. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Fran Strainer. I'm the uh, executive director and CEO of Technic Group. Uh, we've been around since 2013. Uh, we started off by building an infrastructure business called Brave New Coin, which supplies data and indices to power a growing range of uh, tradable products, ETPs, perpetual swaps, options, so on and so forth. Uh, we built out blockchain labs. Uh, we own New Zealand's um, largest crypto exchange, uh, DacetX. Dot com. Uh, we just launched a series of decentralized ETFs and managed funds on Techme.capital. Um, we are unveiling and launching a, a New Zealand dollar stablecoin, uh, which is built on the center circle code base. Uh, that'll be live in about a week after 11 months work. So yeah, we very much focus on uh, infrastructure, a um, bit of fund management. Our uh, DeFi fund was up uh, for the calendar year 2020, 411%. And uh, we're going to be uh, opening up uh, that to the public in about uh, two weeks as well. So lots going on. Steve, you want to go next? Go for it, Lee. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Lee Travers. I'm an executive director at DigitalX. I've uh, I spent the first seven years of my career uh, in listed markets uh, at a wealth manager, predominantly in, in sm uh, small and mid caps, um, and the last seven years in the Bitcoin and digital asset market. So since that time, uh, DigitalX has uh, run a, a major Bitcoin mining operation using geothermal energy over in Iceland. Uh, we've developed blockchain applications, including our remittance application, as well as the first application on uh, the ASX's new blockchain technology uh, DAML, um, and uh, we run two digital asset funds uh, designed to allow uh, investors to access the sector. Um, we have a, a Bitcoin fund um, designed to provide investors with exposure to Bitcoin, track the price of Bitcoin. Uh, we hold physical Bitcoin for that product. And then we have a diversified basket of, of 10 uh, leading digital assets, which includes Bitcoin. Um, recently, we've actually had a Bitcoin fund listed on a number of Australia's wealth management platforms just to improve uh, Australian investors' access and exposure to the space. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Steve Bellotti, thanks for having us. Leo, thanks for hosting. Um, we created a company called TCM Token Capital Management back in 2016. We launched the funds in 18. It's a global crypto long only systematic offering, uh, three year track record with external auditors, et cetera. It's very similar to some of the other guys here on the Zoom. Uh, we've differentiated that institutional strategy from a wholesale strategy called digital native assets. So we've got a, a different offering and a different pricing, et cetera, but the same strategy. We also have an advisory business and some of you along the way may have seen things like the first mint gold token there's another one coming out in America called Homium, where we're tokenizing people's equity in their houses. Uh, we're working on another one around tenant improvements in New York City. So there's all kinds of things going on on the advisory side as well as the asset management world. And I look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thanks very much, Steve, and everyone for, for those backgrounds. And it seems like we have a, a very good range of of topics here from, from macro hedge funds to decentralized ETFs and, and even a New Zealand stable coin. So a lot to talk about today and, and keen to jump into it. But I think we'd be, we'd be rushing ahead of ourselves if we got into some of the more nitty gritty details without uh, first spending a bit of time on, on Bitcoin. So we, we've just crossed, or well, we've had uh, all time highs above 50K uh, USD. I mean, Henrik, from your perspective, I mean, running uh, the CIO of Apollo Capital, I mean, how do you see the outlook what are the main momentum and reasons for this? And uh, what are your two cents on the product? Yeah, so, you know, um, being around this space for, for some time, you know, for, for years we were talking about institutions are coming, institutions are coming to the space, right? And I think in the last six months or so, we have really started seeing, you know, macro hedge fund managers from the traditional space. We have seen investment banks, 
uh, putting out research reports on, on things like Bitcoin. We have seen um, one of the largest banks in Southeast Asia starting their own crypto exchange. And we have actually seen corporates using Bitcoin as a treasury assets, uh, MicroStrategy, Square, and most recently Tesla. Um, so, um, you know, we are, in my view, uh, in the beginning uh, of that institutional adoption of uh, crypto assets and uh, Bitcoin in particular, perhaps from that side. Um, so I'm really excited about this market. Um, you know, we will continue to see a lot of volatility and no one can forecast uh, kind of the short term, but I think the trend is pretty clear. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just from that perspective, Lee, I guess you guys at Investor X, uh, Digital X, sorry, uh, are also running the, the mining operations. I mean, how, how have these all-time highs uh, affected your business and, and what are you seeing as the kind of next evolution here at, at this level? On the mining side, we ran that from 2014 to 2016. Um, at the moment, from our you know Bitcoin exposure, it really is. We've actually got Bitcoin uh, on our treasury, on our balance sheet. Uh, the first public company to do so. We've had that sitting there since 2017. Um, and yeah, certainly pleasing to see. I think Henrik touched on probably three US public companies that have done so now, and and two of those makes a lot of strategic sense. So if you look at Tesla, they're also going to be looking to adopt uh, Bitcoin as a payment currency for vehicles. And uh, certainly we've seen a lot of interest from Bitcoin holders in Teslas as well. So uh, if it increases the price and also allows them to use it as more of the, as the functional currency. Um, I think that's significant benefits. Uh, Square is the other one in, in the US that's a payments company uh, and processes uh, a significant amount of, of retail investors and in getting them into the space. Um, from our perspective, you know, on the fund side of things, uh, these sorts of movements uh, are very interesting. Uh, of high interest, I should say, to you know, wealth managers, financial advisors in Australia when they're getting questions from their clients. Um, we're not really going deep into you know, what does Bitcoin do? How does it work, the mechanics? Although we do have a, a CPD accredited presentation around that. It's really about comparing it to how it sits in a traditional portfolio, how it increases performance, reduces risk. You know, what's happening in the US is probably two to three years ahead of Australia. That's, that's quite typical of how Australian markets move. We're, we're usually a relatively fast follower. And we know that there's you know, nearly a trillion dollars locked up in Australia's self-managed super fund industry as well, which you know, has, has gatekeepers there. It has regulations that prevent investors jumping in too quickly until they've done their due diligence. And I think we're getting there. I think Australia over the next you know, one to two years is, is really going to follow the path of what's happened in the US you know, we've seen Grayscale move from, you know, I think the first year they raised 20 million. Now it's at 20 billion. So, yeah, hopefully we see some similar things coming from uh, the Australian marketplace to, you know, try and keep up with that. Exactly. And I like the fact that you, as you mentioned, you're the first company, uh, at least in Australia as well, to have a treasury in, in Bitcoin or crypto denominated assets. So we'd love to come back to that um, later on. But uh, I think, you know, some of the topics here uh, that we really want to go into then is, uh, really around some of the, the projects and, and other alternative, let's say, coins and and pieces of game momentum. And Fran, I mean, you mentioned uh, a stellar result for your 2020 DeFi fund, so 411%. I mean, could you maybe just walk us through that? I mean, what is it? Explain to everyone what that's about. And um, I guess what's the next iteration and on the horizon there? Yeah, sure. So, you know, information is uh, power essentially, and we have um, built exceptional relationships for a very long time. And, uh, you know, we spend at least 20% of our time just simply talking to the industry. And uh, that allowed us to execute you know, exceptionally well last year. So we ran a private internal funds uh, to on the back of closing down our original fund, that was two year, two year EF only fund. We accumulated a bank of 400% return in EF value. And we paid that out just before the EF uh, bull run really started to uh, break out. So hopefully our LPs uh, listened to us and actually held on to that uh, from, uh, you know, 400 bucks to where it is now. Um, we have been talking about DeFi before DeFi was a word, right? Way back in 2016, how uh, programmable money will allow you to um, do things and that will lead to the disruption of money markets first and foremost. And we're absolutely seeing that now. 
So uh, just by simply gaining exposure to key projects such as uh, Wi-Fi, Aave, uh, you know, all the big, uh, what are now big cap coins. I mean, I structured and ran the Link ICO back in 2017. So that uh, that was a beautiful bump in the um, uh, the HODL One Limited Partners, which is the original fund. And we took those learnings and we put together this POC internally and we've been looking and waiting for a uh, technology platform that is capable of stripping out the middleman of uh, asset management. Uh, we thought we found it with a product called Token Set, but their product has in, ended up being synthetic and not highly collateralized, plus it's pooled. So we're concerned about the SEC and what they're going to do. Instead, we switched to using Enzyme.Finance, which is just rebranded from uh, Mellon. And they are just a beautiful asset management uh, interface that allows users to quickly uh, join into a particular fund or financial instrument. Um, and for us to actively manage um, and basically replicate what we did last year through a um, actively managed targeting mid cap uh, DeFi assets that are clearly showing traction and disruption in terms of their on-chain transactions and revenues and all of the rest. So yeah, that should be launching in a, in a couple of weeks and uh, we focus more on products than attracting AUM. So if, um, uh, we're gonna push these out uh, after our ETPs. Um, and our ETPs are basically, we, we figured out how to create decentralized ETFs. So a lot of people out there uh, don't know um, what to buy, they just know that decentralized derivatives are gonna be a thing or decentralized uh, exchanges uh, and their tokens are gonna be big. Um, and look what's happened to BNB coin, you know. So wouldn't it be great if you could just buy one asset that gives you exposure to up to eight different projects, coins in that space. And then we tokenize that and we call that the ETP or exchange traded protocols or exchange traded pools. Um, and just with the nature of DeFi, it means that such financial instruments can actually be woven into the fabric of the internet. So we don't necessarily need to have uh, Techme.Capital as the only on-ramp. Um, this will be made available, you know, through an interface at one inch and through Trust Wallet and through, you know, multiple ports of entry uh, and on-ramps. Uh, so we're going to push these uh, ETPs and a DeFi fund out into the wild and uh, you know, just focus on the fundamentals of uh, research and rebalancing and uh, capturing uh, opportunities at the optimum time. Yeah, and, and look, Frank, I mean, you touched on some good points there, especially um, what you've acknowledged with some of the risks around SEC and, and de facto regulations in the space, which I think is, is a really good uh, topic and segment when we start looking at, at the types of products available to people, synthetic assets that are being created, collateralization levels and what's going on there. I mean, Steve, I know you have um, quite an extensive experience in this space and have been involved in a number of, of uh, you know, interesting and regulated products. I mean, what is your outlook on the market at the moment? What sort of projects and, and products are you seeing as the the emerging kind of dominant players? Yeah, I think um, I just want to touch on what Fran said there. I think the big themes here are obviously Bitcoin's moved from a not very well understood tech to a from a retail phobia to an institutional driven you know, reserve asset, it's on its way to becoming a reserve asset. It's only a few thousand dollars away from being a trillion dollar market cap. Uh, and I think for the big themes, most people are going to, that are still getting exposure, are going to try and understand Bitcoin first, et cetera. And along those lines, you've seen, you know, the OCC, the Office of Control and Currency, uh, agree for federal banks like JP Morgan, et cetera, to be able to custody, uh, you know, half a dozen types of crypto, et cetera. Uh, you've seen the SEC saying, look, let's just try and swim between the flags. There's always that little bit of FUD where people say that, you know, a country's going to ban it. Well, countries can't ban it. They can ban themselves from using it for their citizens. Um, and so I think it's really becoming uh, in every part of every person's wallet over time. And then the stuff that Fran talks about, not only in terms of access to new products, but access to new ideas via, say, traditional ways, you know, whether it's, ETFs, whether it's the Australian Stock Exchange, uh, strongly likely to list a, a Bitcoin ETF here in the next few months. Um, Canada's talked about doing it. And so in many ways, they've beaten the US to the punch for whatever reason. And so I think three things have really changed, right? Obviously, the macro has changed and the printing presses are on and we all understand that. Uh, but it's not at 2 or 3%, it's a 15% print. So 
that's a serious amount of de- of debasement of currency. So you've got to look at hard assets. The second thing is this DeFi revolution, which I think is huge. And you know, Uniswap just went through $100 billion of notional turnover. And they're not that old, I think four or five months old. And then you look at you know, the hard forking of Bitcoin actually has stopped for the time being. And you know, they're stuck with the original versus the other ones. And then finally, this wall of money. So it all adds up, right? And I mean, the regulatory clarity is just getting stronger. And to Fran's point, the on and off ramps are just getting better and better and better. The infrastructure has been built and continues to be built. So what is today still a very small space in a $900 trillion world of real estate, commodities, equities, and bonds, uh, uh, you know, we're at 1.5 trillion. You know, I think we're going through stage two, which is Bitcoin meets gold and passes gold. And then stage through stage three is really Bitcoin becomes the reserve asset on the planet Earth. And I don't know if that means 50 or $100 trillion of aid, but it's a big number uh, because it's the network, right? And as Mike Saylor talks about it, Facebook's the network of, of people and uh, money network is Bitcoin. And then Ethereum, the smart contract, the 2.0, the Web 3.0, it's all happening. Uh, and, you know, it's still very, very early on the adoption curve. So, yeah, interesting and strong times. Absolutely. And I mean, Lee, from your perspective, right? I mean, running a, let's say, ASX listed uh, product or oh, company, sorry. I mean, what, what have you seen from the public interest and, and moving out of the sort of institutional space and, and really into the retail space? What has been the sentiment uh, from your perspective? And, and do you sort of echo Steve's um, outlook on, on where we're going with the market? I'm actually feeling a bit more bullish after after Steve uh, yeah. gave that outlook there. That was fantastic. Um, from uh, from the, the retail base, I mean, yeah, Digital X certainly has been used as a bit of a, a Bitcoin market uh, proxy. Um, I think we've got around eight and a half thousand shareholders. Um, so, yeah, what that average shareholding would be under five thousand dollars. And so, it's been great to to really bring in, I guess, a lot of Australian uh, traditional ASX investors into the space through having the Digital X listing. We had uh, a number of peers in the marketplace. You know, when 2017, 2018 sort of run came through, and you know we're really the only one uh, still standing on the ASX because of you know the strong requirements uh, for being a listed entity and being involved in the the Bitcoin and digital asset space. I think that's uh, that's been a good thing, uh, and we've certainly done the right thing from a corporate governance um, and compliance perspective as well, um, and and really trying to bridge that gap now into the institutional marketplace, both from a shareholding point of view, uh, given we're, we're retail led at the moment, as well as the, the funds management side. Um, I think some of the commentary around uh, an ASX ETF or, or LIC or how that could potentially look is, is really interesting. That's another leg that would open up the marketplace for Australians, um, particularly from their, their more conservative investment vehicles. So uh, yeah, certainly something that would be on, on our radar as well, um, given our, our position in the market. Um, and uh, and yeah, really positive about the outlook for Bitcoin. Obviously, um, we've only sort of scratched the surface on some of the world's largest companies starting to buy. Um, some of the more macro-led investors have has obviously uh, listed out their reasons why they, they've been buying it. And probably most of them I've seen is just comparing it to gold and debunking some of the uh, common misconceptions around Bitcoin. Um, so. Yeah, I think there's a lot more, um, I guess, well thought through investment analysis to come. Um, and yeah, I think Steve sort of touched on that a minute ago. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Just on that, I mean, Henrik, I know you're also involved in a... <clears throat> Excuse me, <laughs> need to get some water here. Uh, but Henrik, I know you're also involved in a, in a gold project, Meld. Um, we'd be keen to I mean, understand your perspective on this. I think we have quite a few uh, Bitcoin bulls on, on, the, on the panel here now, and obviously yourself as well in the CIO role, uh, obviously long-term uh, believer in this space. Uh, but how do you see that playing out over the next, say, five years, uh, that intersection and, and the role between uh, Bitcoin, gold, and, and let's say other reserve currencies? Yeah, I mean, that narrative with Bitcoin becoming digital gold, that's really... Uh, kind of uh, um, gain speed during 2020. Um, and uh, I, I think that's what we see in the market now. Like people see that there is actually upside in, in holding Bitcoin. It's not just protecting you against uh, some negative scenario uh, macro wise, but you can actually 
on a, a, a growth asset with some properties uh, that are similar to uh, to gold, right? So I think that narrative is is just straight, gaining in strength. And uh, as as Steve said before, like the next phase would be to you know uh, reach the market cap of where where, where gold is, and that would mean five hundred thousand for for around five hundred thousand for, for, for a Bitcoin. Um, so we still have ways to go. We have to reach kind of that uh, market cap, if you like, of of the um, gold above earth. Um, so I think you know if you look at the properties of gold uh, or, or Bitcoin rather, uh, I think more and more people realize that those properties are are actually stronger than than gold's properties. Um, Bitcoin hasn't been along <coughs> around uh, th that long for uh, for for only uh, 11, 11, 12 years or so. Um, but um, uh, definitely gaining momentum in, the, in, in that narrative. So uh, I, w I would expect, uh, you know, over the next five, 10 years that, that really more and more investors see, see Bitcoin as a real alternative to, to gold. And but, I mean, beyond that, right? I mean, store of value, as you said, I mean, definitely picked up momentum as an argument for, for 2020. And I think all of us on this panel uh, probably agree with the sentiment and what's happening there. In terms of actual usage and adoption, I mean, how are you seeing that unfold at the moment? I mean, uh, are you tracking metrics which will somehow support or build a, a case around this being more than just a store of value, or where is the line for Bitcoin, and, and what does that look like? Yeah, I think for Bitcoin, uh, in particular for Bitcoin, it's not so much about uh, you know maybe using it as a, as a currency for payments, right? So for Bitcoin, I really think it's an alternative store of value uh, foremost. And a reserve currency for the world, as Steve put it. Um, for other assets in the space, though, there are definitely use cases uh, for payments. So when I talk about stable coins, which you know have exploded in value during the last 12 months, I think they're around 30 billion dollar now in, in stable coins. Uh, I think you know, th that makes that makes a lot of sense that uh, companies like Mastercard, uh, that perhaps some instant banks. Um, um, would start using the uh, rails of crypto for more efficient payments, uh, perhaps using stable coins. Um, and other assets in the area have, have different use cases. So when I spoke about DeFi, for example, that's more like a new financial infrastructure. Um, so that's kind of building a new fundamental uh, infrastructure um, that is different than the current rails in the financial system. Mm -hmm. And before we go into to DeFi, so I think we, we owe, owe the audience at least a bit of attention uh, diving into that topic. You mentioned obviously the stablecoin market and, and what's presenting there, and that obviously plays a role in, in DeFi and its current momentum. And Fran, I mean, uh, when you introduced yourself, you talked a bit about the New Zealand dollar, NZD stablecoin. Uh, would you be able to just give us some, some oversight and, and introduce us to, to what that project is and the initiative behind that? Yeah, it's called Take a Mint, play on words. Um, Built by Tikami. Uh, it is backed by a quiet, uh, ultra high net worth individual that wanted to see this exist. Uh, 11 months ago, we struck a deal and we spent a damn long time structuring it with uh, Minter Allison and Watson, um, working with Reserve Bank, DIA, FMA, everybody under the sun. Just had the um, uh, bank accounts open today, actually. Uh, so we're going to be doing private placement and onboarding now. It's 100% collateralized, as we believe that's how stablecoins should act. Uh, we don't want any of the convoluted kind of, uh, is it backed, is it not, like what Tether experiences. Um, uh, we're using the center slash circle uh, code base, which is uh, MIT open license and allows for future collaboration and interoperability. The need for stable coins is very obvious. Um, once you digitize a dollar, you can program a dollar. And that allows you to do things. So in the most layman's terms, uh, your options, frankly, are to have money in your bank account, earning half a percent interest, if you're lucky, uh, or digitize that money and earn up to 17 plus percent uh, through various DeFi uh, lending borrowing platforms. Um, it's, it's just an absolute no-brainer. And at the same time, if you look at the Gallup polls or not the Gallup polls, various polls around, the trust in the media, the trust in the banking system, the trust in anything institutional, government, et cetera, is absolutely plummeting. 
globally, right? We're seeing populist uprising everywhere. We're seeing uh, very geopolitical, uh, turbulent environments, uh, you know, COVID, forex wars. Uh, basically, the world's going through a radical existential shift right now from a, a unipolar to a potentially multipolar order. And I'm sure you've all heard of the Great Reset and everything along that. So I'm absolutely not surprised at what's going on with crypto right now. I'd just like to quickly say my uh, my call is we're going to hit 65K, chill out for a bit, go sideways, maybe down, and then hit 100K by the end of this year. Um, What's the uh, significance of 65? Uh, Long-term uh, bans in terms of um, the uh, the old famous uh, rainbow log chart of overbought and uh, under, you know, overbought, oversold on uh, the oldest known pitchfork uh, from way back in 2012. Um, so, you know, we sold our Bitcoin at 17 and a half, 18,000 in uh, 2017 uh, because it just uh, broke outside those bands and it was too overbought. So um, we, we expect, um, uh, yeah, a short term 65 in the year, 100K, that's within the bands. Anything above that is, is free alpha, basically. Um, but yeah, look, sorry, back to stable coins. Um, yeah, once dollars are digitized, you can do things with them. So I would like to see a lot more national currencies with stable coins that are liquid, um, that are 100% collateralized and they're audited. Uh, we're going to have one of the big four as, as an auditor on our project. Um, and then it just opens up options. Um, you know, one day, one day very soon, we're going to have the ability where, you know, I can um, uh, catch up with you know, any of you and I can be like, hey, Lee, here's that. Boom, done. Here's that three hundred dollars I owe you for that thing last month or whatever, right? It'll just be instant peer to peer, and there'll be no gas fees because of layer two solutions that are already available today on multiple chains. So I think that starts to disrupt payments uh, and starts to get into the sort of day to day usage uh, because it becomes grandma proof. It becomes so simple and within the the UX and the UI that uh, people are used to for all their other apps. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a great time, and uh, we're just rushing to get uh, products out because the environment's perfect for it. So I think you know one of, one of the big opportunities there for DeFi, which you've touched on, uh, Brandon, is really leveraging stable coins to, to earn yield um, and, and let's say interest bearing assets. And I mean, Steve, maybe do you, do you have some insight here? And, and how do you see the market opportunity and segment there? I mean, how is <laughs> yeah, I look, I think decentralized finance, which, you know, is a buzzword now and decentralized exchanges a while back, has a long way to go, right? And and I think there's something like $40 billion locked up today. And, you know, that one day there's going to be $400 billion, and one day there's going to be $4 trillion. And when things can be done with ease and people are confident and grandma can do it, then everyone will do it. So... I do think programmable money is interesting, A, because you can get it into the hands of the unbanked or underbanked, and B, through the smart contract, you could do easy things like the person can spend the money at a grocery store, but the person can't spend the money at the casino. I mean, you can just program that so that it won't work at the casino. And I think that's really interesting from a societal and value-added benefit point of view. The other thing I would say is, it's possible, given that the big shift, as I call it, where fixed income, for example, $130 trillion of government debt, 30 plus percent of that is negative yielding nominally, and therefore negative yielding in real terms, uh, and the inflation or debasement that's coming, a lot of that's got to find a way into some alternate assets, right? And, and, and obviously, Bitcoin is one of the, the beneficiaries there. But you could actually have a two tier system with smart money so that you pay the demographic that's old and retired, that owns all of these, what I call crap bonds, uh, you pay them a higher level in their savings. Then if you're a young millennial, you'll get a lower level in their savings because you'll go out and take risk and you're in the workforce for longer, et cetera. So maybe for the first time through these CBDCs, et cetera, these central bank digital currencies, you can see a two-tiered interest rate system going on uh, because of the technology. And the question you asked before, and I think all of us would agree, not only is there a, uh, you know, a crypto sort of revolution going on from a financial perspective, there is a tokenization revolution of everything coming along. Uh, and whether it's property, it's real assets, it's commodities, et cetera, you and I have had some exposure to that through a little company that we know of called Infinigold, which just now became Trovio. And, you know, they're going to commoditize and tokenize a lot of things. 
And the chain allows you to do that, whichever blockchain you're using, et cetera. You know, from a validation, verification, immutability, and liquidity point of view. So I see a world of 24 by seven uh, of real world assets versus the utilities that we're talking about today so far and in DeFi. And I think it's, we're just beginning. So again, super bullish on the whole space. And you've kind of got to, if you look at the products that we've all created together as a community and, this, and the, the way we're doing this, it's actually been uh, pretty interesting and a pretty strong performance by all that have managed to stick through the sort of bear market of 18, sideways market of 19, first half of 20, and then away we go. And, and friends, right, there will be stops and starts, et cetera. But I got to tell you that I've been around 30 plus years in Wall Street, and I've never seen anything like this, not in terms of price appreciation, but in terms of early entry. It reminds me of the very early FX and commodity days when Wall Street came along. And it reminds me of emerging markets when that started out in the very early 90s, late 80s. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's game on, as they say. Yeah. And look, see, I mean, I, I tend to agree, and, and maybe it's we have too much uh, like-minded people on the call, but I mean, I just asked the question, and Lee, maybe you get get your opinion on this, but I mean, factually speaking, some of the yields and, and interest rates people are earning on, I mean, even USDC or, you know, US-denominated stable coins uh, pushes the, I mean, up to even 20% range. I mean, is this a bubble? Is this sustainable? Who and why are people paying you 20% to hold uh, USD? And, and what are the implications of that uh, more broadly? Yeah, in terms of DeFi, it's not something that we actively trade or manage. Um, but from a, a point of view, is it sustainable? I mean, unless the speculative interest is sustained, then no. Um, we know around the, the markets, it's been extremely difficult for uh, exchanges, et cetera, to get access to traditional banking services. So there's been a, a real opportunity there for investors from a peer-to-peer -peer perspective to fill that void. Um, and because of the interest in, in trading on leverage, um, short-term trades, et cetera, and the, the funding rates that people are happy to pay, then you've got really high yields available. Um, so that's, that's one where, you know, I don't think that is sustainable to have that sort of speculative interest persistently. And then the second one is that a lot of the yields have been compensated by sort of platforms or products that are saying, we'll incentivize early users and we'll give you a, a share of the business effectively in, in a token sense. Um, so they're providing uh, incentives for early adopters to jump on. Um, so in addition to the yield, you're also getting a yield in, in the native token, which you know fortunately has been appreciating as well. So it's sort of been a, a perfect storm uh, to, to generate these really high yields. Um, you know, I think with this, you do really have to be careful uh, and have a look where you are yielding product from. Um, you can have risks from a counterparty point of view, um, given that often the yield might be seeking out higher yields. And you can have risk from a, a smart contract point of view, probably a, a weekly occurrence that you see, you know, one of these smart contracts exploited, etc. And then if you're relying on a high yield that's from a a new token that's at an early stage, then you know that that price is volatile and, and can change the yield at a moment's notice. But um, yeah, yeah, certainly it, it is very attractive for those investors that are happy to take a higher degree of risk, um, you know, for their their cash savings or you know it's really really an investment at, at this sort of point and this sort of yield. To, to that point, I actually uh, manage a fund that focuses solely on yield farming at the moment, the Polar Capital Opportunities Fund. So um, we are currently using things like stable coins to get yields of around 50-60% uh, in this market uh, on an analyst basis. Uh, very attractive yields out there. Will they go down? Yes, they will, they will definitely go down right at some point. Uh, but I think the broader point is that, that the crypto markets, I've been in the crypto markets for the past eight years and they have always been quite inefficient, right? So there have always been this type of you can call it arbitrage situations where you can earn excess returns or yields uh, in the markets. So today, what is called yield farming is it's very, very attractive uh, still. But six months from now, 12 months from now, there will be other segments in the market uh, that will be attractive. And you might not even know what those segments are today. Yeah, man. I mean, if you're, if you're not taking your dingleberries and wrapping it up in uh, pancake swap to get LP tokens to then stake them into, uh, you know, syrup pools, 
and earning 2,500% APY, then what are you even doing? It, the best part about DeFi is the ridiculous language. I, I personally love it, right? It's serious, multi-billion financial you know, instruments platforms with names like Sushi and PancakeSwap. And um, at least there's a bit of jovial uh, nature to it, but I fully agree with everybody. These yields will uh, evaporate when the market turns bearish. So make hay while the sun shines. And I mean, just on that, right, I mean, in terms of people coming into the market now and, and looking at this space, I mean, there are obviously a lot of the, the rails and infrastructure that, that we've said are, are being built so on off ramps. Uh, but I mean, what is the major turning point in your perspective, Fran, on, on how do we get, uh, let's say, grandma invested in the space? I mean, will grandma invest in the space or, or let's say, um, commit funds and, and lock up um, tokens for you? No, no, grandma might buy, um, you know, some assets on uh, whatever, say, Australia's equivalent is of a sharesies for crypto, if, if one exists. Um, she might, you know, place, she might have a money manager that places products into any of your um, financial vehicles that are regulated and for the access points that you've uh, created on, on those uh, products. But ultimately, um, you know, the everyday person will end up uh, having um, crypto held inside their bank account. Um, there'll probably be neo banks, new banks, you know, as a generation unfolds and uh, we get uh, smarter operators replacing these absolute dogs that are inefficient, such as ANZ, Westpac, uh, and all the conventional banks. Uh, and with positive legislation, like we discussed earlier, allowing banks to actually custody crypto, that makes uh, Grandma being able to, you know, move money from a, uh, I don't know, a checking account to a saving account at a touch of a button, she won't know that there's, you know, uh, a stable coin yielding uh, some super low risk government approved uh, pool of staking rewards for some government issued bonds. And we're also going to see a melding of, um, uh, you know, free market capitalism that is unstoppable crypto and central bank digital currencies. Um, stable coins kind of sit somewhere in between because they have to be highly regulated and compliant. So, you know, that's something to be aware of as well. We're going to see this kind of branch out as we have like mycelium and popping up at different parts, but it's all part of the same, um, same thing, digitization of value. And um, once value is digital, you can program it. It's just taken a damn long time for the infrastructure of this industry to mature to the point where we now have kind of almost grammar proof applications. Absolutely. No, I think that, that's a very good summary um, from that perspective, Fran. And I think just to, to wrap up here, the topic, I mean, uh, I think we all agree that these are, these are very interesting dynamics in the market. I mean, we've, we've hit all time highs. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin at a certain level, many of the altcoins also following suit. Um, you know, certainly been an interesting space and, and many of the, let's say, tier one initiatives globally really also you know, coming to market, the ASX uh, being one of them with their product uh, we didn't get into today, uh, but also regulations uh, around the world really getting behind this and, and let's say credibility to the space. Uh, just, I mean, in terms of, of panelists today, I mean, if we just go through, maybe if you could share the one final point, I mean, what, what are you most excited about? What do you want to see happen in 2021? And, and what's something that you can get behind and say, Hey, you know, we're, we're really working towards and, and tangible outcomes for, for the next, you know, six to 12 months. Maybe Steve, we can kick off okay. with you. Sure. I, I, what we've tried to do is, I mentioned this offline when we were waiting for a few of the other panel members to join. You know, we created a separate branded wholesale strategy called Digital Native Assets by IO so that we can give it basically initially to wholesale investors, you know, for 10 grand a pop or more, whatever they want. And then, you know, ultimately take it to retail, make it low enough fees that it's not punitive for people to safely and securely invest into, albeit centralized structures, but at least they're getting independent providers, you know, auditors and administrators, custodians, et cetera, along with theoretically some good investment advice. Um, so I think building out those products and allowing people to come in in 2021 is a, is a good idea. And I think just in general, it's still about the education. Right? I mean, we're still very early. Uh, we've got a long way to go, and and I'm a lot older than most of you on this panel, so you'll be educating for longer than I will. But it's a, it's a very interesting space. It's it's hugely rewarding, and if we can expose more people to it, what I like about it most is we're not saying you should risk 
life and limb in this space. But the risk reward asymmetry is in your favor uh, uh, hugely. So you just need a little bit of exposure. And you know, the age old is somewhere between one and six percent, whatever. And you dip your toe in the water through one of those vehicles that Fran's talked about or the others have mentioned. And I think you'll find it an incredibly rewarding journey. So I think 21, it's as I say, it's game on. But um, I think one other difference. There's so much money now that wants to chase the space versus the first time around yeah. that I think the technical pullbacks will be shallower and less than they have been in the past. I could be wrong, but I just think there's too much money coming. No, I couldn't agree more, Stephen. I think that you know the big difference when, when we contrast the market today uh, versus, let's say, the ICO boom in, in 2017 is just, I mean, if you look around uh, the room in 2017, there was probably five, 10 uh, institutional investors globally who were you know, moving markets, so to speak. Uh, nowadays, I mean, the number of crypto hedge funds and the size of those hedge funds and groups, and Henrik, you mentioned AUM, Grayscale. I mean, these are numbers which are you know, in a different caliber and league. And, and there is just that, you know, we've reached that inflection point where there are enough sophisticated investors with enough assets at their discretion uh, to, you know, have serious interests in, in the price stability of, of this market as well. So I tend to agree with that assessment, Steve. But Henrik, how about yourself? What, what's, uh, what's on the outlook for 2021? Oh, look, I'm excited about, uh, you know, scaling the ecosystem, not just in terms of, of the number of people um, entering the space, uh, corporations and institutions and, and retail, but also in terms of the technology itself. So you mentioned Mel Gold before. We, Mel Gold was, uh, it's a tokenized gold project. It's built on Algorand, which works beautifully because Algorand scales. And I think those kind of scaling technologies are coming to uh, Ethereum as well. Uh, which is the most used platform for decentralized finance applications at the moment. So I think 2021 will be the year we'll see, um, you know, some applications moving to uh, L2 solutions, um, which will uh, enable scalability on Ethereum. Uh, and we have other platforms launching as well. So uh, I'm just very excited about, um, you know, scaling the space, both in terms of number of people, obviously, a market cap and all those things, but also the technology itself. Yeah. I'll go next. Um, uh, a few things I'm excited about this year is hopefully no one, uh, particularly around our network, Australia, et cetera, uh, experiencing a hack. I think um, the education that's in the market now is uh, substantially better than it was previously. Um, so, you know, that's a really, really bad experience for anyone that has to go through that. So hopefully we have we have no hacks um, for those that are coming into the market. Um, that the conversations we have with investors are, are more around dollar cost averaging. So coming into the Bitcoin market, um, acquiring more over time as part of their long-term investment, rather than overextending to try and trade the market, because we know that uh, that doesn't outperform, um, particularly if you only have a casual interest in the marketplace. Um, and then, you know, for those that are in the market now, just some solutions to enable them to use their um, digital assets as collateral so that they can uh, not have to sell those and, you know, whether it is pay for bills um, and transact in the typical economy by using that as, as collateral. I think it um, would be a sign to the volatility as well and the acceptance of the asset class by, by institutions to uh, sort of enable that for um, current investors in the market. So. Yeah, I think it's evolving in a really positive way, and I hope that continues. Absolutely, and I mean that's the topic we we didn't get to cover today. So, uh, Marta and the whole sell investor group, I think we we need another panel to discuss uh, the implications of of uh, let's say crypto denominated treasuries and and what Tesla's doing in the space as a pioneer in the segment, and uh, I think you know what governments and other companies will follow next. But I mean, Fran, from your perspective, final outlook for twenty twenty one. What's uh, what's the goal across the pond? Well, uh, newcomers should take it easy. They should not FOMO in everything all at once. Um, they should dollar cost average. Um, I mean, Henrik's written extensively about um, uh, index-based products not really working um, and being the brightest idea because the top 20 market cap changes over time so drastically. Uh, so, you know, we look for thematic um, trends like uh, decentralized exchanges are gonna become bigger. Uh, decentralized derivatives are going to be bigger, decentralized identity, insurance, so on and so forth. 
So for newcomers to just simply find, uh, you know, products that suit their needs and risk profiles and just be uh, cautious. I think uh, Bitcoin will be extremely choppy. Um, I do expect two to three 40% pullbacks um, during this uh, bull market. Um, you know, we need to see some blood. Um, I, um, I hear Stephen's commentary. This is an up only market and there's a lot of institutional money coming. I'm not, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, 40% and stay down 40%. We're going to see some uh, wicks and they're uh, because of overextended, over leveraged longs. Um, and they just need to be reset, funding reset and all the rest. And my final thought is that, uh, you know, th there's a genuine concern with this technology to be weaponized. I've been saying this for years, but there's a big difference between Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies. Because if you create a national currency and then combine it with something important like the uh, credit system in China, for example, then something you say when you're a teenager or some dumb thing that you do, and then all of a sudden you can have your wealth deleted for not towing the party line. That is extremely dangerous. So I support stable coins, depending on the counterparty risk. I support uh, cryptocurrencies and DeFi. Do your own research. We will see mega hacks and lots of disasters along the way, right? So make sure that uh, you know projects actually have their code audited and aren't uh, doing stuff like releasing in production, which uh, uh, you know a lot of companies have got stuck for in this industry so far. Uh, and then just be cognizant of the super macro trends uh, during this uh, global reset, which seems to be utterly failing at this time. I don't know if you saw some of the speeches from the World Economic Forum, but uh, very glad to see that the reset's not sort of uh, in favor with all presidents or all countries. Uh, and then just be you know, cognizant that um, you know, if you're supporting a particular effort, you might be accidentally supporting um, a long-term agenda uh, somewhere. So. Crypto goods, central bank digital currencies yet to prove themselves. Absolutely. Well, it's a, a good way to, to round out the discussion. So thank you very much, Steve, Henrik, Fran, and, and Lee for the input today. And um, yeah, look forward to, to seeing the rest of the Emergence 2021 panel and conference go ahead. So thanks very much for your time. The next keynote speaker today is Joseph Mokanu, who's a managing partner at Verge Health Tech Fund. He'll be discussing the investment opportunities in digital health, which has been one of the fastest growing areas over the last 12 months. More than that, he'll be providing his insights into what are going to be the mega trends over the next five to 10 years in this area. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Joseph McCannu, Managing Partner of Verge Health Tech Fund. And I'd like to thank you and the Emergence 2021 team for giving me the opportunity today to share some thoughts on health tech investment. So let's get started. Now, before I begin, I thought it might be helpful to provide a little bit of background and context on where we're coming from by sharing a little bit about our fund. We are the world's first seed stage only VC fund investing globally in technologies that help expand access quality and efficiency to healthcare. Uh, we do this primarily in emerging markets within Asia, although we do uh, think that everything that we support has applicability all around the world. We are based in Singapore. We have 11 companies so far, and we're a little bit different than a lot of funds in the region in that we're all ex-entrepreneurs, angel investors, and industry insiders. So we have empathy for the startup journey and uh, we have a fairly good Rolodex as well for later stage collaborations and hopefully exits with some of the multinationals. I want to level set a little bit on this presentation in that I'm providing a kind of global overview or, or overarching framework on how we think of healthcare opportunities. Uh, it's based on my own opinions and experiences. However, it's not really a specific guide on what companies to pick or a specific strategy to take. Uh, and I hope that with that, it's still useful to you all. Given that this is a conference about investing, I figured it might be helpful to start with some numbers. So if you look around the world, these are the countries in blue that spend less than $225 a year per person on healthcare. That is half the world's population. And it's only accounting for 3% of total healthcare spend. So let that 
you know, sink in a little bit to see what, what is 20, what is $225? What does that mean for a health system when you spend that little and where are the opportunities? If you raise it up to 550, now you're covering 78% of the world and about 15% of spend. So pretty, pretty big difference up to a thousand. Now you're at 82% of the world, 18% of spend. And if you go up to $5,000 per capita per year, then you're at most of the world's population, 93%. And now you're accounting for a big chunk of healthcare spend, almost half. And finally, if we look at the whole world, you'll notice that we just added uh, one of the major countries in the world. And the United States alone is responsible for almost half of global world spend on healthcare. Uh, for only 4% of the population. And healthcare is growing just about everywhere. And what's crazy is that it's growing at at least 5% year on year for 90% of the world's population and 72% of the world's healthcare spend. Almost two thirds of the world's population is experiencing growth at greater than 10%, but starting from a lower base. This is definitely outpacing GDP growth. If we look at the number of doctors as a proxy for healthcare infrastructure, where can and should this increased spend go? You know, 90% of the world's population doesn't have enough access to doctors. And, you know, this is based on the OECD average. But then what about the quality and the distribution of said doctors? You know, in, in my mind, this is what I think about when I see a doctor. But this is also a doctor. You know, they both hypothetically graduated from medical school. Similarly, where the doctors are placed really matters. I mean, here, if you have a sore throat, None of these doctors are really going to be able to help you, even though there's a ton of them because they're all plastic surgeons in a small area of Beverly Hills. You know, gone are the days where doctors are going through the countryside from village to village, actively seeking patients. They generally like to live in wealthy urban centers and have to deal with this when going to and from work, which uh, also is, uh, is affecting their productivity. Uh, a larger question we're, you know, worth asking is whether our doctor-centric infrastructure heavy health system is still the right model given most of our disease burden is coming from, you know, is no longer coming from accidents, which is here in green, or infectious diseases uh, denoted in red, but rather non-communicable and often chronic diseases uh, shown in blue here, like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, and so on. And these diseases slowly kill you over years or even decades. And most of us only see our doctor when things get really, really bad. In developed countries, this question becomes even more pressing. And then of course, this happened and it called into question everything that we do in healthcare, ushering change that has been overdue for decades. But you know, you're not here to watch me talk about a whole bunch of, you know, easy to look up stats and show some pretty maps. And, you know, I do love my maps. You're here because you want to invest in the space, but I have to disappoint you because, you know, I don't, uh, I don't really have a really good answer because it really, really depends in a, in a place that's as broad and as complex as healthcare is. So it really depends on your own preferences as an investor. You know, do you like to invest directly into deals or indirect through syndicates or, or sorry, direct through syndicates or by yourself or indirect through funds? You know, what sort of risk return profile are you looking for? Are you looking for, you know, regular dividends? Are you looking to blow it out of the park? Are you willing to lose everything? Uh, how large of a check are you willing to write? You know, how patient are you? Do you, do you need your capital accessible immediately or can you wait a decade? Uh, and what are your motivations? Are they financial? Um, are they non-financial? You know, are you impact oriented? Are you doing this out of interest? Are you doing this because it strategically aligns with your work or your business? And then how comfortable are you and do you have experience investing in, in healthcare or the particular subsector, which can be very, very different from another subsector in healthcare? And uh, where do you get your deals from? You know, are you are you plugged in, or do you rely on a, a network of brokers to try to cut through the noise for you, and so on? It also depends on the deal itself. You know, is there a particular area of technology, or medicine, or part of the body, or part of the supply chain that you are really focused or interested in? You know, are are you looking for a ready-made solution, an idea, a proof of concept? Uh, do you like to invest in your own backyard or in faraway lands for diversity? 
and, and what sort of team are you looking for? Are you looking for are you looking for a team that reminds you of yourself when you were younger? Or are you looking for a complete, uh, you know, balanced science or commercial team? Are you looking for diversity? Uh, and uh, what sort of business model do you like in your deals? You know, B two B, B two B two C, B two C, B two G, and so on. And do you like your companies to IPO or be acquired by a, a large player? And uh, you know, what sort of governance structures? do you expect or what role do you expect? Do you want to sit on the board? Uh, are you happy having a, a fairly um, generic convertible note or do you want preference shares? You know, what, what sort of structures do you like in your deal? And then it also depends on which macro trend you're trying to target. Are you, are you targeting the improvement of telemedicine? Uh, you know, the increased importance of high grade telemetry and specialization. You're looking for new business care or payment models within existing infrastructure, or are you looking to take advantage of this massive shift from acute, uh, you know, event driven events in healthcare to continuous and preventative care. And of course, with all these complicated, increasingly technological components talking to one another, there is a, uh, there is a need for greater security and, and uh, integrity of the data. And of course they have to talk to each other effectively using the same language. Or do you want to really go where no healthcare exists today and, or, or where a whole branch of medicine uh, doesn't exist and you want to be the first to play in that area? I had a complicated graphical slide that put a lot of what I communicated in the previous slide into context through kind of an example model, uh, quote unquote, good deal. And I realized it burned like five minutes and didn't really talk about anything too uh, tangible about healthcare specifically. So maybe I'll put it in the future talk. And I do realize that I have been talking about healthcare uh, investment in a quite abstract way without really defining it. Uh, so, so what is healthcare anyways? And I, I look at it as really four pillars. You know, you have basic sanitation and hygiene, the things that we do and what we eat, the health systems with doctors, nurses, clinics, hospitals that we all know and love, and then the advanced research that develops medical treatments, diagnostics, and cures. In the interest of time, I'll focus on the right two pillars. Um, there's always the complaint today that healthcare is not patient centric. You know, our friends at Omada Health put together a nice chart where you see a lot of the activities are, are, are quite concentrated on the providers. And at the same time, you have this rosy picture painted by healthcare futurists where everything will be patient centric, we'll handle everything remotely, and it'll be with personalized gadgets with, with little need for hospitals. And while I agree that healthcare will definitely shift earlier into the patient, I think we'll end up with something in the middle. I mean, you'll still have your patient here. You'll have your telemedicine, your, your wearables that will provide increased telemetry and point of care diagnostics. But we'll also have still the need for more involved diagnostics and decision making at you know, physical infrastructure sites of care like pharmacies, clinics, or, or, or lab or radiology clinics. And then in between the two, we will have the delivery of products like pharmaceuticals to your home, the provision of healthcare services at home, as well as increased health and screening happening at the workplace or at the school. I also strongly believe in the further rise of an intermediary layer of specialty care or specialized care that doesn't have the large resource footprint of the full hospital, where common surgeries or procedures will take place in a more industrialized or, or, or um, I guess, assembly line sort of way, both across developed and developing uh, markets. Aravind Eye Care, or sorry, Aravind Eye Hospital in India is a great example of this. And then in, in the US, Amsurge is a great example of this as well. And then finally, we still, of course, will have hospitals, but they'll be reserved for the most complex and riskiest procedures. And what we'll have, which we don't really have very well today, is a set of a set of you know layers that connect all of this together across payments, data, and and coordination of care. And so, where are the opportunities in all of this? 
Well, we will definitely need clinical grade uh, telemetry. So sensors that give you data that uh, doctors can really make informed decisions off of without actually having to see you as you know, telemedicine calls right now are glorified Skype calls. Um, faster, better, cheaper point of care diagnostics. You know, the improvement of telemedicine and the wide scale adoption of digital therapeutics, that is uh, being able to treat a disease without actually having, you know, having to take a drug or anything. Um, you know, tech enabled delivery services for sure, tech enabled at home services and increased uh, screening and, and monitoring technologies that will help uh, with your productivity and, and wellness at work. So things that reduce absenteeism, reduce stress or measure stress, increase presenteeism and, and so on and so forth. We will still, of course, need our brick and mortar infrastructure, but they'll increasingly have technology integrated into them uh, as well as the ability to communicate across each piece. Uh, standardized operating procedures will be really important as this is traditionally a very fragmented, thus inefficient sector. And at the core of all this will be all the, the software solutions. You'll have, you know, third-party administrators will be quite important in all this because they are the gateways to the, to the data. Um, right now, they're largely used for adjudicating claims and looking for fraud in insurance, but increasingly they'll be important in medical management and linking to other components of this new digital uh, healthcare age. Uh, there'll be fintech opportunities and payments, you know, throwing in the buzzwords of AI and analytics. I really hope we'll get beyond just looking at a doctor's calendar into more proper case management and, and true care coordination. And of course, uh, underlying all of this uh, scalable, robust, structured, uh, doctor and patient friendly health information systems that uh, will really serve as the, the central data repository and the ability to kind of glean insights as well as predict things and, and looking things beyond just a single patient into a whole population. We will still need, of course, the, the quote unquote hard medical devices and biotechnologies uh, and, and the more expensive ones will of course see or, and the more involved ones will of course see the light of day uh, more in the specialty centers and hospitals. And really it's gonna be the light devices, diagnostics and simple drugs that you'll see at the primary care level. And this is definitely not exhaustive. I mean, we are just scratching the surface with the potential opportunities, although I hope it's helpful to kind of paint a picture of where there may be some interesting places to play. So you might be wondering, you know, where, where have we played? Um, so within our fund, we've probably been a little bit biased towards the left side of this slide, given the regulatory and market entry barriers are a little bit lower and the unit economics are, uh, a bit more affordable to your patients and your, your payers that are really trying to shift care earlier as well to avoid, um, you know, the, the access and affordability challenges that you have more towards the right, at least in the markets in which we play. Um, you know, there certainly is merit to playing more to the right side. Uh, and you'll certainly potentially get higher returns given the superior individual unit economics of say a $200,000 per dose drug uh, versus what you'd see on the left. But you also see a lot higher risk, longer development times and uh, you know competition from the traditional life sciences VC sector that's invested billions in this space. Uh, as an angel investor, I've played along a similar theme as well. And, you know, while there's a lot of icons on this slide, we are just scratching the surface. I mean, there's so much more work to be done. And you might also be wondering, how can I as an investor get started? And the simplest way is really find someone in healthcare that you, you really respect or resonate with. It can be, a, you know, a new source. It can be a particular startup that you want to get to know better. It could be an investor and just see what they put out, you know, see what they talk about, see, you know, see if they have a newsletter, if they publish papers, blogs, et cetera. 
Or if you want to start, uh, you know, putting your money to work, you can always invest in funds or ETFs whose objectives and philosophy align with your own. Uh, but given everyone and their uncle seems to be starting a health tech fund, you know, buyer beware, please make sure they, they do know what they're doing. Uh, and if you want to start getting more involved directly in investment opportunities, you can always join a health tech angel club like Future Health in Singapore or Medical Angels in Australia, as an example. And if you would rather invest your time than your money, you can always volunteer at some health tech accelerators or incubators or join a startups advisory board or board of directors because often health tech startups lack that sort of real hardened commercial and business experience, which you know most investors having gotten to a point of their lives where they can be investors have really the ability to uh, help these companies here. And if you really, really like a company so much, you could always just join it yourself. And, and the potential upside is probably much, much higher than you know investing any sort of money into the startup, provided it works, of course. You might also uh, finally be wondering what's next for us. Uh, we were quite lucky uh, during COVID last year, we managed to close our first fund. And believe it or not, we're actually nearly finished investing it. And it seems like the thesis is, is still working out. And what we'll be doing over the next year or so is really looking at what the startups and investors really need and really want in order to figure out how a potential second fund might look like. So with that, I wanted to thank you again for your time and attention. And you know, my contact details are here on the slide if you have any questions, comments, or strong opinions. Uh, Love, love to have uh, philosophical debates and uh, wish you a wonderful day ahead.